Hello, this is Storybooks channel. New videos are posted every day. Subscribe and click the bell. Nancy has always dreamed of becoming a doctor. She went to school and thought after graduation she would go to medical school to graduate and start her professional career. Well, daughter, have you changed your mind? Her mom asked her all the time. Of course not. This is my dream, and I will achieve and go to it. Answered her. All right. Well, I'm counting on you. When you have a doctor in the family, it's wonderful. A woman came up to her and hugged her. They lived in a small town, and when Nancy was about to enter school, she learned about the construction of the Baikal Amer mainline. The girl herself did not know why she was so beckoned there, but she wanted it. No, my dear, you first enroll from study, and then we will already think about the construction of the century, the woman said. All right. Nancy could not disobey her mother. They were always together, always listening to each other. And now Nancy couldn't just leave the woman she loved more than anyone else in the world. She enrolled in college. The years of study began. Everything went well. One might even say perfectly. Nothing the girl wanted so much as to fulfill her dream and go to the place where she thought she was expected. First year, second year, third year practicum. She liked everything, but she wanted to help people. Class, are you going to the dance tonight? Her friend, with whom they shared a room, asked her. No, I'm not, she answered her. And indeed, Nancy didn't go anywhere. She stayed at home, studying everything. Studied encyclopedias, really wanted to know more. She was one of the smartest on the course too. The teacher was always praised and prophesied a brilliant future for the girl. And when the years of study were behind Nancy, as the best student on a Komsomol ticket was sent to the construction of the highway, how had she been looking forward to it? And now there was an opportunity to get a job, to get a good salary, and with it everything else. But for a long time, the girl did not have to disappear there in that cold land on the shore of Lake Baikal, but she didn't know it yet. Daughter. Where will you go? Her mother hugged her goodbye. Mom, for the good life, she told her. What a good life. The woman didn't understand it. We'll see, the girl told her. She waved goodbye. Then she got on a bus and went to the station. There she bought a train ticket and now she was on her way to her dream. Nancy had heard many different stories about this construction site. She realized that it would be hard, but she still aspired to go there. She arrived, indeed, got a job as a medic. They gave her a raise. So far, she couldn't say anything bad about it. Not a couple months later, she met Noah. He was a handsome young man who was always joking, thanking, singing songs on his guitar. He just saw the fiery girl and immediately approached her. Are you here alone? He asked her instead of greeting her that day. Yes, who should I be with? The girl was surprised but no husband, no children, no one. He wondered. No, she shook her head. We'll be friends. I'm Noah. He gave her his hand. And I'm Nancy. She said cheerfully, it's really nice to meet you. It seemed as if Noah had nothing more to say right now. Though before, when Nancy saw him in companies, he was always joking about everyone and saying different things. And that made me feel embarrassed for Nancy. What are you going to do this weekend? The young man asked her. I don't know yet. What do you have to offer? She asked. And let's get out into nature, put up a tent, a leg, make a fire in a cauldron something boiled, he suggested to her. How romantic does that sound? Of course I agree, Nancy answered him. And over the weekend they had it just as Noah told the girls. Couldn't help but like it. Then they'd walk hand in hand, he'd walk her home, and to wherever she needed to go. And already the young people themselves did not notice how it happened, but they began to live together. Nancy thought she was such a hostess. She tried to cook something tasty for her boyfriend, but they didn't live together for eight months. Like Noah said he had to leave. How long will you be gone? Nancy asked him then. You know I don't know myself, but I think I'll be back soon. He smiled at me and touched the tip of his nose. I'll be waiting for you, she said to him, 
and gave him a hug. Good, and I will definitely come back, mouth no. Kissed her and got into the car which was now heading to the station. The second month passed, and when the third Noah had started, there was still no Noah, but Nancy realized that she was expecting a baby. This news both pleased her and saddened her. The girl realized that she could have the baby here, but if she did it at home, where her mother would be around, it would be several times easier for her than alone. Noah never arrived. Nancy inquired where he lived from his friends, but they didn't know anything. So she packed her bags and headed back. It was bitter to realize that as soon as her dream came true, she had trusted, one might say, the first man she met. And he did this to her. My, you're home. She entered the apartment and immediately called out to the woman. Nancy came out of the kitchen. Yes, it just so happened that I had to come back. She waved her hands in the air. So come in, tell me. What happened? The woman was getting worried. Mom, calm down. Nothing happened. Everything's fine. Except you're about to become a grandmother. But I don't think that's bad news for you. The girl stood by the table and ran her fingers over the tablecloth. What? How did this happen? The mom was shocked because her daughter always was. Look, she checked 100 times before she did anything. Don't you know how this happens? A man and a woman meet, and then she stops talking. Yeah, I know how it happens. How it happened for you, sighed the mother. But she realized there was nothing she could do now. The only thing to do was to wait for the deadline and then bring up a grandson or a granddaughter. Mom, everything will be all right. The daughter hugged her mom. What about your work turned to her woman? Nothing yet. But I think, with the recommendations that I was given from the old place of work, I'll be taken. The girl was sure of it. That's great. When they day with it while the term is small, you have to go to settle. Her mom had told her. Nancy had done just that. But now she wasn't accepted. Nancy, don't worry. As soon as you have a baby, be sure to come to us and we will take you in. The head doctor told her, I will. Surely she promised him, though she thought she would not be taken anywhere now. It was no use. They lived in a small apartment where the girl had grown up. Now only her mother brought money into the house. It turned out that Nancy was sitting on her neck. Mama, don't you worry. When the baby is born, I'll definitely go to work and we'll have everything. She told the woman, I'm not worried. I know you're a hard worker, and you'll do whatever you set your mind to. You'll do it. Her mother would come up to her and give Nancy a hug. And that's exactly what she needed from her. Time passed quickly. And now she's in the last month of her pregnancy. Everything had been fine up to that point. So Nancy didn't even think she would have any complications. She did. Everything was fine. She was seen at the same hospital where she came to apply for a job. The doctors made her feel welcome. They knew that perhaps the girl would become their future colleague. A wonderful baby boy was born, who was named Charles. When Nancy saw him, she stopped doubting. If before she had any doubts about whether she was doing it for nothing or not, now she was sure that it was her son and she would do everything to make him stand on his feet. Grandmother as well as mother doted on her grandchildren. When Charles was eight months old, Nancy received a phone call. The head doctor told her that if she was going to go to work for them, she had to do it now. The mother turned to the woman that my kin, she was always ready to come to her daughter's aid. They're calling me to go to work. But to do that, you need to stay with Charles, she said. Sure, what are you talking about? I'll stay. The woman worked in a heavy industry and now on some level she was even glad that she would have to quit. Nancy started work as she had expected. She was well received. Everyone socialized with her. The employees helped each other with everything. At first the girl was put as an assistant surgeon. She understood a lot about it, so it could not be otherwise. Time passed. The son grew up. Nancy worked. When Charles was two and a half years old, the women decided it was time for him to go to kindergarten. There's a regime with his father and everything else. 
There were practically no lines in those days. So the boy went there with his peers. So, Nancy, how is your work there? Her mother asked her. You know, it's fine, she said. I don't get to say hello. The woman sighed and sat down on a stool. What's wrong with you? Why didn't you say anything? The daughter was surprised then. What to say? I thought it would go away, but it doesn't go away. The woman said sadly, so I'll talk to the head doctor and we'll probably put you in our hospital, Nancy told her. The mother didn't mind, but she didn't want to go to the hospital. But once Nancy had made up her mind, she had to follow through. The woman was admitted. It was mostly Nancy herself who took care of her. Of course, she couldn't stay in the hospital overnight. When she was on duty, she'd go home to her son. And when she was on duty herself, then both her son and she were all at Nancy's room. The woman was discharged. She saw that the girl was crying. She realized that no pills, no surgery, nothing would no longer help her mother and barked out of herself for having missed the moment when the disease had just begun. Daughter, don't get upset. Everything will be fine, her mother told her. Mother, I blame myself for the state you are in now. At first, the daughter cried at the psychiatric hospital, but then she could no longer hold back her tears when she talked or looked at her mother. That day, they escorted Charles to September 1st. He stood at the line so beautiful, so happy. Grandma was already getting around, but Nancy couldn't deny her that last opportunity to be happy for her grandson. She got a wheelchair from the hospital, put her mother in it, and drove her. And that same evening, she felt sick. Grandma, please open your eyes. Sitting and crying beside the bed was the grandson. The mother came running to Nancy's screams. She saw that the woman was no longer with them. She took her son by the hand and led him out of that room and went to the kitchen, sat down at the table, and wept bitterly. Then there was a funeral. Charles cried a lot there too. He couldn't understand what had happened to his grandmother. He asked her to get up, but she would never get up again. Nancy realized that now all the burdens of raising a child and everything else would fall on her shoulders. When the boy was in elementary school in fourth grade, Nancy was offered a promotion. She had finally become a real surgeon and she herself had some assistance. It couldn't have been more gratifying. But at the same time, the work was multiplied. The son became more and more independent. He could prepare his own lunch and dinner often because his mother was almost always away. She would come running in the morning. She managed to sleep for a few hours while Charles was at school. Then she tried to pay attention to her son somehow. They'd do things together. They'd do homework they'd go out, but it was very rare. Of course, Nancy thought about all this, that you can't let things go, but she couldn't help it. By this time, she had never met anyone. Although there had been suitors, men confessed their love to her, gave her flowers, called her for a date, but she chose work and her son, realizing that if she got a man, she wouldn't have enough energy for anything. One day, Nancy was returning from night duty and saw several young men in front of the entrance. She went over. One of the guys was her Charles. What are you doing here? She asked him. Oh, mom, come home. I'll be right up, he answered her staggered. She realized she'd missed something. And her son might have gotten mixed up with some bad company. No, I told you right now we're going home together. She took him by the sleeve of his jacket and dragged him toward the driveway. Get off. He yanked his arm out. How do you talk to your mother? She didn't get it. As I want, so I talk. He answered defiantly. Nancy thought the boy didn't want to appear weak in front of his classmates and friends, or worse, a mama's boy. And the woman also realized at that moment that the kid was going through transition. She was on her way home. Tears dripped from her eyes. Nancy realized to herself that she had devoted herself to her work and paid little attention to her son. And now, when Charles came up to the apartment and sat beside her on the couch, she tried to talk to him as gently as she could. Charles, you realize that times are hard right now. If you keep living like this, you're not going to make it. She told him, Mom, why didn't you tell me this when I was growing up? 
Only now when I've already done something wrong. Or maybe I did it to spite you, to draw your attention to myself. He said it with a hint of anger in his voice. I'm sorry, darling, but I'm doing the best I can for us. I work, I bring money into the house. If it wasn't for me, who would do it? She told him, while she was crying. The son went to bed, and when he woke up, apparently, he thought about everything. He went to his mother and hugged her. I'm sorry, he said to her, and she saw that he really said it from the bottom of his heart. Well, it's all right, sit down at the table. She said it for him. She grabbed her keys, grabbed her purse and headed out. Are you going back to work? Charles asked her, but you wouldn't understand. It's my job, it brings us income. That's why you have things. Everything else is food on the table, she told him. The guy didn't argue. But now he didn't do anything out in the open anymore. Everything on the sly so his mother wouldn't find out. Before graduating from high school, the guy slipped to a C, and his mother had to take a vacation to sit with him at lessons and pull him up. Have you been doing so well all these years? Look at this. She opened the diary in front of him, which is full of twos and various notes from teachers. Oh, mom, who needs this school? He said, well, you don't need it, but I do. There's only a little bit left. Try harder, she asked him. And Charles tried. He had a few C's on his diploma, but he had graduated. And now he and his mom were standing at the line, and it was graduation. Do you remember when her son turned to her? What did she ask him? Like when we were standing at the line, when I went to first grade, and grandma was with us, Charles muttered to her. Nancy realized the exact moment she had missed the child. That now that so many years had passed, he still remembered the grandmother he loved so much. Nancy, would you come into my office, please? The head of the hospital asked her. Uh, sure, something's wrong. She wanted to know now. How do you release me? Or I'll wait for you at my place, and you'll find out calmly. The man answered her. She did not understand what to expect from this conversation. Usually the chief physician's office was not summoned just like that. Nancy stepped over the threshold. She tried not to look at the man sitting behind the desk. Have a seat, the man in the white coat told her. She sat down on a chair that was near the desk. So, Nancy, I'd like to offer you the position of chief of surgery, the head doctor said. That she was very surprised, because there were no prerequisites for it. Why are you so surprised? You are an excellent surgeon, and I think you can handle being in charge of a few more surgeons. He smiled. Good, she nodded. Does that mean you're in? Well, yes, it's worth a try. And now that she had a new position, and she realized that the salary would be higher, the woman decided to sell the apartment they were living in now and buy something bigger. Charles, what do you think? She asked her son. I'm all for it. He answered. The young man was preparing to enter the institute. Of course, his mother had chosen him, but he was just as much as she didn't mind giving it a try. Now that the apartment was bigger than Nancy's, it seemed to breathe more freely. Charles was away studying, so she missed him a lot. But the boy had promised her he'd come over more often, and he kept his promise. At one point, he didn't come alone, but a girl was with him. Mom, don't be surprised. It's Miranda. We're friends. The boy told her. I'm not surprised, his mom replied. But of course, she thought to herself that her son could have told her earlier that he had started dating a girl. Today, they sat for a while. And then the woman had to run out for the night shift. Charles and Miranda met only a few months ago. They were studying at the same institute, and one day their groups were brought together for a class together. There they met eyes. The guy didn't realize what had happened to him. He just saw her and fell in love. Can I meet you? He caught up with her in the hallway after class. She turned to him. Hi, I'm Charles. He said, smiling. I'm Lilia. She answered calmly. Nice to meet you. You have such a beautiful name. The young man said then. You have a nice one too. It was obvious that she did not mind this acquaintance. Afterwards, they went to a cafe. The guy treated the girl with sweets, ice cream, cakes, 
and when it became clear that they lived in the same dormitory, it became fun. How come I've never seen you before? Charles asked. I don't know. I've never seen you either. She laughed. From that moment, the young man and the girl began to prepare for subjects together, to go to the institute and back. But on one of the days there was an unpleasantness. Girlfriends invited the girl to a birthday party. Will you come with me? She asked the young man. Look, probably not. What would I do there? I don't know anyone. Okay, I'll go alone then. I hope you don't mind, she said and shrugged her shoulders. Sure go, he answered her. That evening they went out that night at Miranda's friend's house. Her parents weren't home, and they had set up their unbeknownst to her. But in the middle of the night, perhaps the neighbors called or the parents themselves decided to come back. They came home and saw a horrible scene. Four girls who were friends just lying around. A birthday party. Not only were they celebrating with pies and salad, but they'd bought hard liquor. What's going on here? Father asked sternly. At that moment, the girlfriends stood up. They were escorted out of the house. The girl had nowhere to go, so she went to the dormitory. The janitor saw her there. And the next day, everything was known at the institute. The scandal was hushed up, but the girl was expelled, and now she was studying at a local school. Of course, it was not as prestigious as the institute, but at least it was something. So why didn't your parents intervene? Was Nancy curious when her son told her the story? Because I don't have any. My father's out there somewhere, but nobody knows where he is. And my mother was stabbed in a fight by a roommate she'd been living with for years, Miranda told her and tilted her head. God, what scary stories have you had in your life? Nancy crossed herself. To us now, when we graduate, I think we will come to our town and live here. Look the son at his mother. Yes, of course, I don't mind. Glory was happy that her child trusts her and they want to live in her apartment. Now as long as they were home almost every weekend. Miranda was always there for Charles. The woman liked the girl, she was a homemaker, did everything around the house, never sassy, never rude. So she took her in like family. Mom, we'll probably get married said to her one day, Charles, Charles, you've graduated from the Institute, what's left? She pointed to his fingers. Indeed, Charles had only a few months left to study. Then there was practice, defense, state exams, and the diploma was in hand. Here at the Institute, Charles studied differently than at school, took everything more seriously. He realized that his future career would be connected with it. So he didn't rest. Graduation was over and Charles and Miranda went to his mother's house. They were living here now. Okay, guys, come on, you wanted to get married. And while it's summer, we've got to make the most of it. Warmth, berries, different vegetables. We got it all, we've got it all. So don't delay. Go to the registry office and apply. Mommy, you better kiss her on the cheek, son. There weren't many relatives who could be invited to the wedding. Friends of the young man, and the girl was also few, so the mother suggested celebrating the wedding at home. But home is home, Charles shrugged. On the appointed day, Miranda went to her room to put on her dress. It wasn't even a wedding dress, but a simple white floor-length dress that was fitted to her figure. What a beautiful dress you have mouthed. Nancy, when she saw her future daughter-in-law, Charles gave it to me, she replied. Look. I've got a present for you, said Nancy. What is it? The girl didn't understand. Why would she want to give it now? Look. The woman opened the slate and took out from there a snow white hat, to which a veil was sewn. What a beautiful thing Miranda said at the time. Yes, that's what we used to take on a trip to a foreign country. I bought one for myself there. I don't know why or where I'd have wanted to go in it. But now I realize why I did it. Nancy placed the hat on the girl's head, and she became even more festive, even more like a bride. They went to the registry office, and the young people signed. The guests gave, flowers congratulated. It was possible to go home. They could go home, where Nancy had already set the tables. Everything went very cheerfully, toasts were said, 
There were some contests. When the guests had gone, Nancy collected all the dishes, took them into the kitchen, and began to wash them. Let me help you. Miranda came over. Oh, come on. Go on. You've got a young husband there. Nancy laughed at her. What are you doing? Look at this mountain of dishes. I'll help, said the girl. Together, they did it quickly. Charles joined them at the very end. He took towels and wiped the plates and glasses. All was well with the young family. Charles got a very good job. Of course, not without his mother's help. He was now earning good money and also had weight in the community. When two years had passed since the wedding, Nancy called Miranda to talk to her. Daughter, you're not doing well with the children, she told her. I don't know. Shrugged the one. Maybe go to the hospital to get checked out, her mother-in-law suggested to her. Wait, we are still young. Everything will be in time. Miranda didn't want to find out there was something wrong with her. All right. Well, don't let it be too late. Nancy warned her. And then Charles was offered a position in some distant city. Where is this? Was Nancy looking at him? Oh, come on, Mom. It's a city of millions. Things will be very different there, he said. And now they were getting ready to leave. Miranda, why aren't you going? My mother-in-law was surprised. We decided that I'll go first. I'll get settled there, and then I'll come. Miranda, Charles replied. Understandably, there was little joy, because Nancy realized she would not be alone. It wasn't until her son left that her mother learned the real reason why Miranda was staying here. Mom, I want to talk to you, said her daughter-in-law to her and led her to the sofa for both of them to sit down. What's wrong? Didn't you understand? I'm expecting a baby, said the daughter-in-law. Well, that's good news. That's good news. She jumped up off the couch. Nancy started pacing the room. You realize that this is not a good time to have children. I wanted to ask you to arrange for me to have an abortion, Miranda said. Scary words for Nancy. Are you completely skillful? What kind of abortion? Not just over my dead body, insisted the woman. After that, Miranda continued to live with Nancy. She and Charles called, texted. They never spoke again. When the day of the birth came, Nancy was there for her. She helped with everything. And when the baby was born, she was practically the first one to hold him. Miranda will call it. She walked up to her sister-in-law and handed the baby over. Jacob, she answered. Oh, what a name, said the woman. And Charles came up with it. The daughter-in-law looked at the child and realized that she would have to stay here for at least another year. Don't worry, I'll help with everything. I'll be there for you, her mother-in-law reassured her. I'm not worried, the girl sighed. And then when they got home, it started. Nipples, diapers, skates, hospitals, whatever. When Jacob was a little over a year old, Nancy came home from work and saw her suitcases packed in the hallway. Where do you think you're going? She looked at her daughter-in-law. Mom, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to my husband, Miranda told her. What about Jacob? The woman looked at her fearfully. Jacob is staying with his grandmother, Miranda said. She took her suitcases, opened the door and left the apartment. But how could it be? Nancy stood in the hallway, confused. She didn't have a job after all. She didn't need one at all. A small child who would stay with her. But there was nothing left to do. So Nancy went to the room where the little boy was sleeping. But hello, my darling. What are we going to do with you? She sat down beside his crib and patted his back. Since Jacob didn't go to kindergarten yet and they hadn't gotten a prescription yet, Nancy realized that she would not be able to handle either Jacob or the job, if she did both. So she went to the head doctor and asked for a leave of absence. Sure, Nancy, look, how many years have you worked? Never taken that vacation. And if you did, you went out almost every day, the man told her. He would have sent her himself but she never agreed. Thank you. Nancy thanked him then. The woman came home. She did everything for her grandson, cooking for him, washing, ironing, 
doing what his mother should be doing now. But what, Jacob dance, we got a ticket to kindergarten. She told him then. The boy smiled. And so the next day in the morning they go there. For two weeks, the grandmother took her grandson to kindergarten. When the adaptation passed, she realized that now Jacob would stay in the kindergarten from eight to five. It was possible to go to work, but what would happen with night duty? She did not understand. At first, the woman left her grandson with a neighbor, a girlfriend, or someone else. The older Jacob got, the worse and worse his temper got. He was disobedient. No words could work on him. In kindergarten, he fought all the time. When he was in the older group, he could bite. His parents were always complaining about him. Nancy didn't know what to do. And she found only one way out of this situation to leave work. Everyone saw her off, even those who were no longer working. She cried for how many years she had given to this profession. And now, it would seem, there is still strength, but it is necessary to leave. Don't be upset, everything will be fine. Take care of your grandson's upbringing, don't think about anything. Her colleagues told her, okay, thank you, she replied. Now the woman was at home. Apart from raising her grandson, she did nothing else, but it took up so much time and energy. And she was constantly worried about him, nervous, it raised her blood pressure. When Jacob was in fourth grade, she received a phone call. Hello, she said excitedly into the phone, realizing that the class teacher wouldn't just call. Nancy, what's wrong Jacob is fighting with the seniors again? His parents want to talk to you. The woman was telling her, of course I'll be there, Nancy worried. And the next day, she went to the principal's office, where the other kid's parents were waiting for her. The woman was so worried that her blood pressure was up and she thought she just wouldn't make it to school. They were sitting in the office. The principal was saying something. The other parents were saying something too. But Nancy didn't understand anything right now. When the principal noticed this, he quickly called an ambulance. The paramedics came straight to the school. Nancy was taken away. She was admitted to the hospital. Oh, I can't go to the hospital, she said. I've got a little grandson. I've got to look after him. Then the doctor went to meet her. He gave her a drip, gave her an injection, and let her go home in the evening on the condition that tomorrow she would come again and spend the day here. The older Jacob got, the worse and worse he got. Nancy didn't understand at all how normal parents with normal upbringing could raise a child like that. In seventh grade, he started smoking. His grandmother immediately noticed the smell of tobacco from him. It got even worse. Nancy called her son repeatedly. Charles, do you realize what's going on here with your son? I can't rein him in at the wrong age. I've got heart palpitations. I'm always worried, nervous. She told him. Mom, you understand. I can't come now, he answered. He and his wife only sent money to the grandmother and did nothing else, as if it was not theirs. It was the son at all. And Nancy continued to raise Jacob. She did everything she could to keep him in the apartment. Sometimes she wouldn't even let him go to school, so he wouldn't do anything wrong. But he still found ways to see his friends. Jacob, I can't take it anymore. His grandmother told him once. The kid was in ninth grade. That's all I need. I'm gonna finish ninth grade, and I'm gonna leave. He told her. Where will you go? How will you go? She made big eyes and her heart started beating faster again. I'm going to leave school to go on with my life. Of course I'll be at your place, because I have nowhere else to go. Jacob didn't seem to be talking. I made a condition. What school? Jacob? My family. You have to go to the 10th grade. Finish normal school. Go to the institute, then work. Grandma read it. Who needs your institute now? Did you look at her? Everyone always needed it. The woman didn't understand why he was so stubborn. Grandmother sighed, but there was nothing she could do. Now at her age, she realized that she was no authority to her grandson. Probably not to her son either, because in all the years they had been away, they had never once come to visit mother and son. The grandmother didn't know where they were at all. Jacob went to college.
as he wanted to. He wasn't paying any attention. What was his grandmother telling him? What did she want? What was she doing? The most important thing was to have a place to sleep. In the morning, his grandmother would make him some breakfast. He would wash his face, leave, and come back either late in the evening or quite at night, and sometimes he could stay up until morning. It made Nancy's heart pick up again. She knew she should go to the hospital, but she didn't because she realized her grandson would be alone again. Somehow she wanted to do something and couldn't remember Nancy went, sat down on the couch. She looked out the window and went over in her head what she had planned an hour ago, but couldn't remember it. And then she began to notice that she was starting to have some memory lapses. She forgot her sister-in-law's name. When a neighbor asked her, she couldn't remember where the threads were in the house. Now the woman became afraid to go out on the street because once when she went out and then came back home, she mixed up the entranceway and entered a completely different apartment number, also as if to erase from memory. She reflexively went up to the floor she lived on, wanted to open the door, but not the one she lived in. What do you want here? Did a man open it then? I live here, said Nancy. No, you're confused. I live here. I slammed that door in her face. She came out of the driveway and was spotted by Nancy's neighbor. What are you standing there for? She came up to her. Molly Nancy exhaled a sigh of relief at what she recognized. Molly, thank goodness at least I remember you, she muttered. And they hugged. Did something happen to you? Molly asked her. Yes, I did. I got the wrong entrance and went into the wrong apartment. She told her, look, you can't go out alone right now. What if you go out and then forget where you live and never come back? Her neighbor warned her. Today, she took her to her apartment. Jacob could see that something was wrong with grandma, but he didn't ask her anything and she didn't tell him either. When he had almost finished his education at the college and was about to receive his diploma, Jacob met a young girl. Obviously, he had nowhere to take her, so he brought her to his grandmother's house. Meet Kelly. This is Kelly, he said as they entered the apartment. He gestured to the girl to develop and walked to his room. Are you going to eat? Asked him Nancy. Now practically all over the house where the woman lived there were notes spread out. What to cook, what to say, where to go, what to take. If she remembered, she wrote it down immediately. In those moments when her memory came back, she would try to quickly write something down or think about something. Before, when she worked at the hospital, she never thought this could happen to her. Now Jacob she remembered and knew. But Kelly was a new person to her almost every day. Nancy, hello. The girl said to her as they bumped into each other in the hallway. So who's bouncing off her? Here we go again. Jacob, your grandmother, has gone crazy. Don't pay attention to her, the young man kept telling her. You see, I don't like all this there. She did this here. She forgot to do that. We can't get rid of her somehow, Kelly asked him once. You what? That's my grandmother. And if my parents come over, what am I gonna tell them? My fiancé didn't like grandma, so we put her in a nursing home or something. He told her. But no, maybe she'll go to the hospital for a while. They'll fix her up, do whatever she needs. The girl offered another option. No, let her live in her room, walk around the house. She's doing fine here. For the first time in his life, Jacob took his grandmother's side. He saw how she suffered, how she was always looking for something, even though it was on the surface. Okay, I didn't know what else to say. Kelly, she kept looking at grandma and no to help her, just grinned and went off to her room. Jacob needs to go to the store, grandma was telling him. She definitely needed an escort because she had already tried to leave the house alone and then barely found her apartment. So now she had an alarm clock set on a certain day, at a certain time, when she had to go shopping. She also had the same alarm for the pills she needed to take. Okay, wait, he answered her and started to get ready. Right now, though, the guy didn't feel like it. He would get dressed and take his grandmother to wherever she needed to go. Just recently, the woman had given her grandson money to buy himself a car, and now he could get around in it. 
They went with the grandmother to the store, bought groceries, brought them home, laid them out, and only then did he go somewhere else. Kelly stayed home most of the time while Jacob was working or out with his friends. She spent all day talking on the phone or lying in front of the TV. After Jacob and Grandma came home from the store, Kelly figured out what he could do with Grandma so he wouldn't have to answer to anyone. But the girl didn't say anything to anyone. They continued to live all together. Now the girl, so that Nana would remember her and not scare her every time she tried to be around. She helped Nancy cook peeled potatoes, cut onions, and did everything her grandmother asked her to do. No one understood a thing. And when the next time came to go to the store, Jacob was not home. So the girl offered the woman her help. They walked to the store together. Kelly took the basket, gave it to the woman, and when she disappeared between the shelves, Kelly safely left the supermarket, leaving Nancy here alone. But the woman didn't know about it yet, so she strolled calmly through the store and thought nothing of it, when the basket was full and she had to go to the checkout to pay. And then the woman stood up in confusion and started looking around. Now it seemed to her that she had come here with someone, but she couldn't remember with whom. And what should she do now? She doesn't know. And she didn't know where she was, either. Nancy put the grocery basket on the floor. She just turned her head back and forth, thinking that her grandson had lingered somewhere near some shelf and would come to her now. Nancy walked between the rows, looking for Jacob. She wanted to shop to ask someone, but Nancy couldn't afford it. There are so many people here. She was just afraid of them all. Some time passed, but there was still no one. Then she walked out of the store to avoid attracting any attention. Kelly went back home. She was not to say happy, but happy that she had come up with such a plan. And now, even when Jacob came home, she would tell him that the grandmother had left the house, alone, and had not returned to the girl. It seemed like she had everything planned out. And most importantly, the plan was perfect. She went to the kitchen, decided to cook a holiday dinner. The girl knew only two recipes that she had seen her mom make when there was an event in the family. It was French meat and manti. But if with the meat Kelly could still somehow manage, she doubted about the manti. The girl pulled the meat out of the refrigerator, peeled potatoes, nabbed tomatoes. The sauce was here, as was the cheese. All that was left was to assemble everything, put it on a baking tray, and wait for it to be ready. While the dish was cooking, Kelly went to her room, changed out of the refrigerator, got a bottle of wine, sat down at the table, and waited for her young man. Jacob returned. He saw Kelly doing something in the kitchen. He got curious. He went over there. When he saw what she was cooking, he was even more surprised. Is it a holiday? Did he ask her first? No, I just wanted to make you happy, to sit, together, to talk, so to speak, romance. She stood up and wanted to kiss him. Where's grandma? He asked her and also saw only two glasses on the table. But why? If we're celebrating something, why not the three of us? I don't know. Kelly shrugged and turned away from the table as if it didn't concern her at all. She started slicing bread, spreading it out on a plate, so she wouldn't have to look the young man in the eye. She just wouldn't turn around. I don't know how. We all live in the same apartment. Where could she have disappeared to? He smirked. I don't know. Go look in her room, Kelly muttered. She realized now that her plan wasn't as perfect as she thought. Why are you telling me this? Grandma's coat is gone. Her shoes are gone too. Is she sitting there in her room with her clothes on looking at her? Look, why are you picking on me about your grandmother? I don't know where she is or what she might be. She went to a neighbor's house. Maybe somewhere else Kelly was talking about. She was ready to burst into tears. What do you mean she left? Jacob asked her sternly. How should I know? I was in the kitchen, and maybe she got dressed and went out. Kelly raised her voice. She can't leave the house alone without you or me. He told her, and was starting to get nervous. But Jacob, Kelly walked up to him, and wanted to hug him. But the young man took her hands away. Either you tell me the truth now, 
or I'll find out anyway. The young man looked at her with anger. Yes, she said, let's go to the store. I thought it wouldn't be a big deal if she went alone. So I let her go. Kelly made innocent eyes, and then she started to cry. How could you let that happen? Where can we find her now? Jacob realized that if something happened to his grandmother, his parents would not forgive him. And how will he look himself in the eyes after that? The guy quickly grabbed his jacket, got dressed, and went. It was very cold outside. He realized that his grandmother did not have such a warm coat, and she would not be able to stay outside for long. He drove to the very supermarket that they used to go to with her all the time. No matter how many times he ran around the store, asked the guards and clerks for people, no one had seen the small, unpleasant grandmother. No one could tell him anything now. Jacob had never been as worried about the grandmother before as he was now. He realized that the helpless old woman was alone in the city she knew no one, and even if she did, she might not know where to go. It would be getting dark soon now, and where would she be at night? Jacob drove through the streets that were closest to the store where he assumed Grandma was, but never saw anyone. Jacob returned home. He was very angry. How's it going? Any luck finding him? Did Kelly meet him? No, Jacob mumbled. Let's go to my favorite. I made dinner for us. You don't seem to be having any trouble at all. I looked at her. Oh, you'd think. You loved your grandmother so much that you're worried now. Puckered my lips. Kelly, yeah, realize this is her apartment. Now my parents are gonna call and ask how grandma's doing, and what am I gonna tell them? He asked her that question again. You won't say anything. You'll say she's asleep. The girl always had some excuse for everything. You are a hearty man, Jacob told her. He looked at the girl and couldn't understand how she could be like that. You'd think you'd better remember how you talked to her, what you said and what you did. She reminded him of his behavior. What did it matter now? What was already important? What was happening now? He turned on the kettle, poured himself some coffee, sat down at the table in the kitchen, and began to think about what he should do next. All night, the young man agonized without sleep. The next day in the morning, he went not to work, but to the police. He had to write a report on the disappearance of a man. Hello. He went into one of the offices. Come in. A man in a uniform was looking at him. I want to write a missing persons report on my grandmother. The young man sat down on the table and stared absent-mindedly at the one sitting behind the desk. Okay, tell me in detail what, when, and how. Spoke the interlocutor and took a paper to write down. I don't know what kind of illness she has, but she, if she leaves the house, then afterwards cannot remember where to return, Jacob muttered. When did this happen? Asked the employee leading questions. Yesterday afternoon, Jacob answered him and he thought to himself that now he would be told that he had invented something and that he should wait. After a while, Grandma would come back, but he wasn't ready to back down. So, here's some paper, write a statement. And if you have a picture, and we'll start looking, said the young man behind the desk. Okay. Jacob wrote down everything he had learned yesterday from Kelly. After that, he pulled the photograph out of his pocket, of course, it was not the first fresh, and the grandmother on it was even younger than she was now, but he had no other. They took all the documents from the boy, promised to call if anything came up. And now Jacob was on his way home again. But how's it going? Kelly asked him. Is it going well? How's it going? How's it going? I'm not making any progress. And get away from me. I don't want to talk to you yet, he told her irritably and he went to his room. He had to think again. Jacob, I'm so sorry, please. I really didn't think it would be so serious, she answered, and again she made eyes and tried to hug the young man. And what did you think? If she goes out into the yard and then cannot go into her driveway, now she will reach from the store to our house or what? I didn't understand. I don't know what I was thinking at the time. I'm sick of your grandmother with what she does at home. Kelly was angry. This is her house. This is her apartment. She earned it. She bought it. 
She raised my father here. She and my mother lived here. And then me. At that moment, Jacob thought about it. But in fact, he had only seen his parents in pictures on video and heard their voices on the phone. But he had never seen them in real life. It made him feel bad. But now all his thoughts were occupied only with the fact that he had to find his grandmother. Only she was always there for him. She forgave all faults, was always ready to support, and most importantly loved him. And what if those to whom he applied quickly find out everything and find her? But she couldn't have gotten far. And the city here is not very big. The girl answered calmly. And if something happened to her, what if she's cold? How long has it been? And she's in such light clothes. Maybe she was hit by a car. And now she's lying in some morgue. He stopped, didn't he? He went to the stores, looked for her around town. But he didn't call any hospitals or morgues or anything to ask. If they'd received a woman like that, the guy immediately grabbed the phone and began to call all these instances. But his grandmother was nowhere to be found. Tonight he went to bed because he realized that fatigue had come over him so much that tomorrow he would not be able to do anything. At night, the young man had various nightmares. He woke up several times in a cold sweat. Kelly was sleeping peacefully next to him. And how can you sleep peacefully? He said to her aloud. But the girl only rolled over to the other side and kept sniffling. Further in the morning, also no news, just silence. Then Jacob himself called the local office and found out how the case of finding his grandmother was progressing. We're doing everything we can. That was the only answer he heard. This did not satisfy him very much. So Jacob started looking into trying to find his grandmother on his own. And Nancy, when she left the store, walked down the sidewalk. The woman thought she should at least recognize her house or yard. At some point, it seemed to the woman that she recognized the area, that perhaps it was her yard. She went there, went to one of the entrances, and sat down on a bench. There were some people here. Nancy sat and watched them, thinking that maybe if she didn't recognize the people, they would recognize her and someone would come up. But no one did. They all walked past. It was getting dark. She got up and went to another yard. And this house seemed familiar to her. She sat down on the bench again. It was getting very cold in the evening. The woman laid down. She wanted to go somewhere else, but at that moment such a strong wind blew. A blizzard was beginning. Nancy looked around, and she could think of nothing but to go into the entryway. The woman went in there, stood there while stomping her feet, because it was not so warm here either. And suddenly, the door opened and a little boy ran in. Grandma, what are you doing here? Looked at her surprised. Hi, what's your name? She leaned toward him. Mason, he told her. He saw that she was so cold she couldn't even speak clearly. Her lips were blue. She couldn't get a tooth on a tooth. I'm Nancy. She smiled. Why are you standing here? He was curious. Why are you running so late? Look what's going on outside. She wagged her finger at him. I went to buy bread. He showed her a bag with a loaf of bread in it. Where's your mom? You can't let a little boy like that go shopping for bread, can you? She stood there and told him off. My mom is sick, he said. She's sick. That's too bad. Nancy grinned. She looked at the door of the entryway. Behind it, she could hear the wind howling outside. She stood there remembering what this boy's name was. Who was he anyway? Nancy, don't you have a home? The boy asked at the same time. No, it's somewhere, but I don't know where. She was almost crying. Come and visit us. He held out his hand to her. Can we? She asked him. Why not? You'll freeze and die here. He answered her. Nancy grinned, but followed the boy because she had no other choice. She entered the apartment. The place smelled strongly of medicine. It was like something popped into Nancy's head and she remembered. But what did she remember? She didn't know. Couldn't get a grip on the thoughts that were flying through her head very quickly. Come on, let's go through. The boy saw how cold the grandmother was. They came with her into the kitchen. 
He immediately put the kettle on the stove, poured her hot tea, and only then ran into the room to his mother. Mom, do we have guests? He said to the woman. What guests? She didn't understand. At certain moments, she began to cough very badly. And for some reason it was then that Nancy felt good and happy. Some memory lived in her, but she couldn't remember it. Nancy, have you had your tea? Jacob asked her. Did she look at him when he approached her? No, I'm Mason, he told her Mason. Again the woman looked at him with empty eyes. He took her hand and led her into his mom's room. Here mom, meet Nancy. There's a very bad snowstorm outside. And she's a thin little boy, all she could do. And I decided, so she wouldn't die, to take her home, he said. Hello, come in. The woman coughed again. Hello. It's like she didn't realize what she was doing here. And why had she come here? She saw a thermometer on the table, some pills. She went over, took the thermometer, and slipped it under the woman's arm. What are you doing? She didn't understand. We're going to change the temperature, and then it'll be clear, she said. It was like a doctor talking. Nancy, this is my mom, Lisa, said the boy. Yes, yes, your mom will be fine now, said the woman. Lisa realized at that moment that there was something wrong with their guest. Is your name Nancy? She asked her. Yes, Nancy. The woman said. Tell me, has something happened to you? Lisa asked quietly, because if she raised her voice, she would immediately start coughing. I don't know what happened to me. I sat down on a stool. Mason, why don't you go look in Grandma's pocket? Maybe there's something in there, his mom asked him. Mason went and looked, but there was nothing there. When he entered the room, the woman blossomed into a smile, wiped her hands for a hug. Jacob said to Nancy again, What do you think I am? Jacob, I'm Mason for the tenth time I'm telling you. The boy couldn't understand what was happening to her. Nancy, are you lost? Lisa asked her a question. She'd heard stories of old people losing their memory, leaving their house, and then not knowing where they were going. Yeah, I can't find my house. Nancy put his head down. All right, I see. You can stay with us as long as you want. You still have relatives, and someone's gonna put out a BOLO. They'll find you. And if you move around, it's gonna be hard enough. Lisa told her. After that, she thought she should call the local police station to let them know she had a grandmother. What happened to you? Nancy asked her, even though she realized that in a few minutes she would forget everything she was going to be told here. As my son has already told you, my name is Lisa. I used to have a good life. I had a happy family. I was in high school, and I met a young guy. He seemed very nice. Then I went to school. He went to the army. Wires. Tears. He didn't believe me that I could wait. But I was not like that. And of course I waited, wrote letters. He came back, proposed to me. Lisa began to tell the story. At this time, Mason sat on his mother's lap. He had never heard the whole story before. Some of it he knew, some of it he guessed. But he had never heard his mother tell it like this. Lisa drained a little for now, then took in a lumpful of air to continue her story. She realized that this was eating her up inside. And now to this strange woman, who yet remembered nothing, she could open up and tell what had happened to her. But mom, what happened next? Her son asked her. And when he proposed to me, everything was so romantic. My parents didn't want to let me leave my native village, but my husband wanted to. And we left with him to work in the city. They gave us an apartment. Lisa continued talking. She was silent for a short while because she needed to catch her breath. At that moment, the woman lay back on the pillow and looked at the ceiling. It was obvious that she was having a very hard time and that the husband had turned out to be a scoundrel. Asked her Nancy, who tried to get into the gist of the conversation, but could do nothing. No, then I found out I was pregnant. We were both overjoyed at the news. Our beloved daughter was born. We seem to have a complete good family now. Everything's great. We had an apartment a job. What more to look forward to, if everything was? She stopped talking again. 
Lisa, and then she started coughing. So both Nancy and Mason freaked out. The boy ran into the kitchen, got a glass of water. He stirred something up, lifted his mother up, and gave her a drink. Wow, you have such a little boy, and already you have to do so much. The woman said, yes, because there is no one else to help but him. Lissa didn't agree. She was breathing hard now, and it seemed as if she wouldn't say anything more. Mom, will you continue? Her son asked her, yes, if you are interested, of course I am. Mason sat up and stared with all eyes, and then I don't know what happened in our lives. While I was on maternity leave, my husband started coming home on time less and less, and when he did, he made all kinds of excuses. He was at a friend's house, or someone had an emergency. He helped, and then went to a neighboring town to meet his classmates. Even though he'd always studied and lived in this town, I tried to believe him, but at some point it became impossible. He didn't come home for the night on the second day and on the third. And when he came back, I asked him directly about the other woman, and he didn't deny anything. He had indeed had her. Nancy noticed tears running from Lisa's eyes, and now she remembered something too. The same feelings she had had. But when and with whom? Unfortunately, she couldn't remember that. Yes, it had happened, the woman said briskly. No, nothing happened then. I decided not to do anything and just let it go. I know the forbidden fruit is sweet. And if you're allowed to do everything, you won't go anywhere. And so it was. We were gone for a few days, and then he came home. Lisa smiled. That he just knocked on the door, came in. Nancy wondered. Just like that. After that, there were apologies and gifts and flowers and all that. Until the daughter turned 12, Lisa went silent again. What happened then? Now Mason was already asking questions because it was also his father, whom he had never seen. He was gone again, this time for good. No matter how many times I called or wrote, he did not answer, did not get in touch. It was just me and my daughter. Before that, I was cut down at work, and I have been sitting at home for a year. I could not find any work. My husband brought some money, but it was not enough for anything. A couple of months after he was gone from our house, I realized I was expecting a second child. Lisa exhaled. There was a whooshing sound coming from her chest. That was me. Asked Mason, who was listening intently to every word. Yes, baby, it was you. Confirmed his mother. And then what happened? And then the worst happened. My daughter demanded that I had an abortion, that we didn't need a child from that man, and we didn't have any money to raise her. I didn't work anywhere. No one would take me if I was pregnant. You have no idea what my daughter screamed at me. She thought that if she had nothing now, then later, when the little child was born, all the attention and purchases would be for him, and she would be left with nothing. A cough began to choke, and so the story had to be interrupted again. Nancy sat staring at one point. She understood how Lisa felt in those moments, but how did she understand it? Right now it seemed to her that the woman was telling her story, not her own. Well, it's getting late, let's go to bed. I'll continue the story tomorrow, Lisa said. Again the coughing began to choke her. Mason stirred something in her glass again, she sipped a little but it didn't help her this time. Nancy didn't bother to argue. Mason showed her where to lie down, and she shot herself up on the couch and lay down. During the night she dreamed about something, some people, and she didn't recognize any of them. They were all going somewhere, saying something, doing something to her. In the morning, she woke up, she felt very bad. Her head hurt, her blood pressure was high, she needed pills, but she didn't know where to get them. Mason, come here. Nancy called out to him. What do you want? He ran up to her. Do you have a first aid kit? She asked him. Yes, a boy ran into the other room and brought back a whole box of pills and various jars. She started looking at the pills and smirked, realized to herself that she didn't know which pill she should choose. This really annoyed the woman because she knew how annoying all this could get to people. 
Go ask my mom what pill I should take, she asked him. In a few minutes, the boy returned with some pills in his hands. Nancy drank one. After that, she ran a little. She felt better. She got up and went to the room where Lisa was lying. Good morning, she said. Good morning. Lisa lay like that. Nancy helped her up. They went to the bathroom, then to the bathtub. Lisa even tried to sit with them in the kitchen, but so far it was very difficult for the woman. Nancy went and found groceries in the refrigerator and made breakfast. At this point, she asked Mason for a pen and paper and wrote down everything she did yesterday. What's the boy running around next to her? His name is Mason. That's why she didn't mix him up today. After breakfast, they all gathered in Nancy's room. I wondered why the boy was home and not going out, because I don't have the ability to pay for kindergarten and everything that goes with it. The woman said, Mom, come on, tell the story further. Asked her son, what is there to tell? The pregnancy went normally. The daughter was completely out of hand. She started doing everything out of spite, going out, taking someone home. Lisa cried again and waited for him to come into the world. When I was six months pregnant, I was admitted to the hospital. And when they took all the tests, the doctor saw that there was something wrong with my body. I couldn't do anything because I could hurt the baby. So I waited, feeling like I was getting worse and worse. And when Mason was born, I had an MRI. Turns out I had some kind of tumor in my larynx. I needed emergency surgery. I had to leave the baby with my big sister and go to the hospital. I heard all kinds of things from my eldest daughter, but I needed to be healthy to raise my second child. The surgery was done and afterwards I felt very well. I went everywhere with Mason, spent all my time with him. And then I got another infection. I had a slight fever for a long time and they put me back in the hospital. By now Lisa was just crying. Mommy, calm down. Please, her son hugged her. At some point, the eldest daughter found a young man and said that she was going to live with him. That she didn't want to know us at all. She warned me not to give birth, but I didn't listen to her. And so now she was very angry with me and just left the house. Lisa continued to say, but then what happened to you after the hospital? Nancy just asked that's what she wanted to know. And then they told me that the tumor had come back and I was doing badly, they said I had nothing left to live for. Just nothing. Lisa cried and looked at Mason again. Mommy then sobbed in Mason's voice. Lisa cried with him. Even Nancy couldn't help herself at that. Okay. That's it. Enough of the dampness here. Up she got. She waved away her tears and headed for the kitchen. Can I help you? The boy asked her. Of course, she replied. Together, they began to peel vegetables, cut potatoes, cabbage, all to boil borscht. Oh, how nice. I haven't had real borscht for a long time, the boy said. And you've actually eaten it. You're too young for such soup. Nancy smiled softly. I have. Mom used to make it, he said. After that, they were in the kitchen for a long time, waited until everything was boiling, closed the lid. The soup took place for a while. Then Nancy poured it on plates, all that was ready. My God, it's delicious. You have golden hands. Lisa looked at her, just because she wanted to call the station and tell them that Grandma was at their house. She'd forgotten all about it. What about your daughter? Do you have no contact with her at all? Did Nancy ask her when she came in? For some reason, that was the memory that came to her mind now. Not at all. Lisa admitted to her. I see. Agreed Nancy. Today was the end of her second day living in this apartment. She realized that she probably had someone, and maybe even someone looking for her. But who was it? And how to find them? She had absolutely no idea. Mason was small. Lisa couldn't. So tonight, she went to bed thinking only about whether or not she had relatives. Lisa, do you mind if I stay a little longer? Nancy came in the next day. Do you? Of course you do. You're doing us such a favor. You made a nice borscht yesterday, didn't you? Lisa smiled. Nancy lived in the apartment now. 
She did a lot of things around the house, cooking, studying. She was enjoying it very much. Grandma, why don't you and I play a game? A boy asked her. When she heard that word, she wanted to latch on again to some thought that had flashed through her mind, but she couldn't. I think I have a grandson too, she said to the boy, so we should definitely find him. He told her, yes, I understand that you must, but I don't know how to do it, sighed Nancy. The woman didn't know why, but she liked sitting next to Lisa. She'd tell her things. They'd listen to each other. When Nancy had to turn the woman over, she could do it herself. But her strength was so low, she couldn't do anything. One day Lisa had to get an injection. She usually did it herself, but now she asked Nancy to give her an injection in her buttock because in her leg where she had injected herself, there wasn't a live spot there anymore. It was all bagged up. Nancy came over, took the syringe, drew the medicine, tapped the needle professionally, made sure there was no air left. Did she inject it like that? I didn't even feel it. You weren't a medic before, by any chance? Lisa asked her. I don't know, said Nancy. I see. I wish I knew something about you. Lisa said regretfully. Another week passed. It was clear that Nancy herself would not remember anything. She had to be taken to a doctor or something. But who would do it was unclear. Mason only knew where the store was, which was located on the corner of the house. There was no way Grandma could have gotten there on her own. And Lisa couldn't help her. So they all stayed in the same apartment. Stay with us forever, the boy told her. But if nobody finds me and nothing happens, then I will have to stay with you, she said and laughed. During this time, she had gotten used to people, and they to her too. Nancy did everything right in the house, never forgetting anything. She had everything signed everywhere, where everything was, what to take, what pills to take, what to put in Lisa's room, and so on. She didn't even think of going out, because she was afraid that she wouldn't find the apartment. Then there was no telling what she would do next. This morning Nancy woke up out of habit and went to the kitchen to make breakfast for herself and Lisa. For drinking, she opened the refrigerator, took out the eggs, and decided to fry the pieces into cups. She diluted the milk with the eggs. After that, she cut the bread into quarter wall pieces. Then she tortured all the slices in the mixture. She poured oil on the skillet. Then she took the pieces out one by one and threw them in. It was delicious. It smelled good. Mason came running in. Nancy, what are you cooking? He asked her. You'll see for yourself. She was already making tea in mugs and putting everything on the table. Oh, it smells so good. I can't wait any longer, the child said. Mason, you don't go to kindergarten, but you're going to school. A woman asked him once. Of course I'm going to school. I already know all the letters and I can count to 20. He told her, oh, that's good. In the evening, the woman sat at the table with him. She knew that in the evening she might forget everything. So she took out her notebook and wrote down in it that later she should see what Mason could do. After that, they went to the room. Colia treated her to breakfast too. Could you make me some coffee with milk? She asked the woman then. Of course. This is the smallest thing I could do for you. Nancy went quickly to the kitchen so she wouldn't forget anything. After that, she did everything that the lady of the house asked of her, brought it to her. Thank you so much. I've wanted to do this for so long, but Mason didn't make me do it, and I'm so busy said Lisa quietly. She and Mason were sitting in the room when they heard Lisa start to cough. I'm going to dilute her syrup now. Cups. Mason mouthed and ran to the kitchen to get water. Good. Nancy went to the woman's room. She lifted and head sat comfortably in the bed. Mason at this time brought a glass of water. He added some sort of syrup to it, as he did the rest of the day, and handed it to mom. It made her breathe easier but it still didn't make her feel any better. When Nancy saw that Lisa had her eyes closed, she thought she was going to sleep. So she and Mason went into the other room. Remember you promised me you'd show me what you could do? Nancy asked him again. Sure. 
The boy took out the big alphabet book he had and started showing the woman the letters he already knew, then did the same with the numbers. Nancy could see that this child was truly developed. She only wondered who was practicing with him. That's what I decided to ask him. No one tutored me. I did it on my own. Till the batteries ran out. He showed me the alphabet book that had batteries on the back. And when you pressed a letter, it would spell it out. Wow. What a good boy you are. Nancy complimented him. She was so used to this family that she didn't think she'd ever lived anywhere else. It seemed to her that she had always been here. Video was like a grandson to her. Every day she took him to the store, forced him, gave him money, and the boy ran. He wasn't used to it. Sometimes Nancy would sit in the kitchen until something rattled or rumbled in the next room. Then she would flinch and remember that she wasn't here alone, that there was someone else. Nancy, mom's not feeling well again. Mason came to see her this morning. He was almost crying. The woman could see how hard it was for that boy to live. She realized that he was still so young and had taken on such a big responsibility. They were going back into the room to help Lisa again. Today Nancy saw that the woman was not well at all. She was breathing so hard that it was frightening for her health. After Lisa was feeling better, Nancy decided not to leave her side. She remained sitting in that room. Mason said he was very tired and went to get some sleep. Glory sat up. She was already dozing off in the chair. The woman saw some people in her dream again. They were saying something to her. A young woman threatened her with her finger. But who was it? She didn't understand at all. Nancy heard Mason screaming and opened her eyes. Nancy, look, I'm bad for mom, he said to her. At that moment, Nancy looked at Lisa and saw that she was not only coughing, but as if she was choking. Mason, quickly call an ambulance, the woman shouted. Mason ran to the phone. It was something he had to do more than once. He dialed the number of the ambulance, said his mom wasn't feeling well, dictated the address. They told him the doctors would be there soon. What to do? He ran around the room, afraid that his mom was going to die. That was the worst thing for the boy. He often thought about it. He even had scary dreams, but he tried to distract himself. As usual, the boy ran to the kitchen, filled a glass of water, added the medicine to it, and they tried to pour it into Lisa's mouth. But it didn't work. Mason, do you have any medical instruments at home? Nancy asked him. What exactly was the boy looking at her for? He didn't know what she was talking about. At that moment, Nancy got up from her chair. She took some alcohol from the nightstand and began to disinfect her hands and vomit on them. Nancy, what are you doing? The boy looked at her. Say, do you have any tools at home? Syringes, a scalpel or anything like that? The woman spoke quickly. Nancy did not recognize herself. How did she know such words? And why did she need all this stuff anyway? The boy ran out into the hallway. He had brought some sort of suitcase. When Nancy opened it, she was very surprised. It was a set of surgical instruments. She quickly put on gloves, picked up a scalpel, and started touching Lisa's neck. Nancy, what are you doing? The boy was very frightened. So be quiet and come help me, she muttered. Nancy rubbed the alcohol on Lisa's neck. She went lower to the chest, felt everything with her fingers, and turned to the boy Mason. Have you ever had them put an IV in your mom? She asked him. Lisa was already rolling her eyes at this point. She was almost completely white. I don't know who the boy was and sat down on the floor. Now is not the time to be crying. Quickly look for the non-tube that you screw onto the needle when you put in an IV. Nancy said knowingly, where do we find it? I don't know, hummed the boy. He was really scared. Now Mason, this is no time to be drooling. Let's do this. She looked in the nightstand herself. There was nothing there. Then she told the boy to get a regular pen. He had brought one and was now standing beside his mom, watching Nancy wanting to make a cut right into her. Please don't, for she will die, shouted the boy to her. So shut up and hold it there. Did she show him where to put his finger? 
Mason did as the woman said. She wiped the case, the handles with alcohol, and then quickly did something else at the address and inserted the handle. And at that moment Lisa sighed. No sooner had they done all this than they heard a knock on the door. Mason ran to open it. There were medics standing on the threshold. They entered, saw a woman lying on the bed with a pen sticking out of her throat. Who did this? Asked one of the men in a very stern voice. Nancy at that moment felt bad that she was suddenly drawn to help. It's Nancy. Mason responded immediately. The nurse, turning to the woman, held out his hand to her. And when Nancy put hers into his, he shook it firmly. Woman, did you work as a doctor? He asked her. I don't know, replied Nancy. She was sitting back in her chair now, her hands shaking. She knew she had done the right thing. But how did she know that? Nancy had no recollection at all. When the others came in and brought the stretcher with them, they all looked at Nancy respectfully. And when Lisa was already being carried into the ambulance, the one who had come in first looked at Nancy again. You did the right thing. If it hadn't been for you, she wouldn't have lived to see us, he told her. Good. The doors closed. The boy and his grandmother were left alone in the apartment. How did you know all this? The boy clung to her. Mason. And if I had known, cried Nancy. She realized that without proper education, she could not have done any of this. And she probably had it. Today they cleaned up Lisa's room, and the next day they went to see her at the hospital first thing in the morning. The woman was very afraid to leave the house, so she asked Mason for the number of a cab. He quickly went to the neighbor's house and found out. After that, he and Nancy called a car, and now he was to take them exactly to the address. Lisa was lying in bed from her throat already showing fears from home. Nancy smiled at her. Nancy was approached by some woman. Yes, she turned to her and looked at her with a blank stare. Don't you recognize me? The nurse smiled. You know, my grandmother has some kind of disease. She forgets things all the time, said Mason to the one who approached. So come with me. They left the boy in the room with his mother and walked down the hall. Now Nancy was sitting near some office, waiting for the girl who had greeted her to come out. Not a few minutes later, a man came out of the office. He looked solid and looked at the one who was sitting in the hallway. Nancy, hello. Why didn't you go to the hospital? When did this happen to you? He came up to her, took her hands. I don't know what happened to me. She looked at him. What about your relatives? Why didn't they do anything? The man didn't understand. Don't ask me anything because I can't answer you. She lowered her head and cried. All right, let's go and have a look at you. He took her to some office. Everyone recognized her. Everyone knew her by name and patronymic. The woman had some MRI procedures, tests, and everything else. And Nancy didn't talk to anyone. She just kept quiet because she didn't recognize anyone who was here. When it was over, the head doctor of the hospital ordered that Nancy be assigned a private room and put her there. No, I can't leave Mason alone. The woman turned to them. Don't worry, we'll take care of him, said the man who had met her first. And indeed, there was another bed next to Lisa's, where Mason could sit. The woman needed surgery so he could be near his mother now. And the boys also showed him where Nancy's room was so he could go to her too. The head doctor went to his office. He decided that if Nancy wasn't with her relatives, which is possible, they might not know where she was at all. He dialed the woman's home number. Hello, he heard in the receiver. Hello, this is James, the head doctor of the hospital where Nancy used to work. He introduced himself. Hello. On the other end, the young man's voice trembled. Jacob, I believe it was you who guessed. A man. Yes. Is there something you want to tell me about my grandmother? He asked, because he wanted to. Yes, she's in our hospital right now. And if you want, you can come and see her, he said. To him sternly. Yes, we'll be there right away. He said, at home. Jacob hung up the phone. He turned to the men. What happened? She asked. 
She had always wondered who the young man was socializing with and what he was doing. But he was hiding everything. I think we found the grandmother, he answered. But at the same time, he smiled. Who called you? Kelly jumped up from her seat. Ever since grandma had been lost, the young people had hardly spoken to each other. Jacob was so resentful of his position that he could not talk to her yet. So I'll tell you all about it on the way. For now, quickly pack. Take everything you need. We need to find slippers, a robe, some underwear, and take it all to her. She's alone in the hospital. She has no one. Jacob was talking fast. Kelly did as he told her. They got in the car and drove off. In just a short while they were there, Jacob ran down the steps. He couldn't believe it had really happened. And Grandma would be home again now. He promised himself that he would never do to her again what he had done before. James was already waiting for him. Hello again. Can you tell me where my grandmother is? He asked. She's in room nine, the man said. Really? For some reason he despised Jesub. It seemed to him that everything that was happening now was because of him. Jacob and Kelly walked quickly down the hall. He saw room number nine at the top of the hall. He knocked and opened the door. Grandma, hi, he said quietly, seeing that the woman was awake. Who are you? She asked them as they entered. Grandma, this is me, Jacob, and this is Kelly, my girlfriend. He told her, Jacob, you're so small, she couldn't believe her eyes. Yes, Grandma, I'll always be little to you. I'm sorry. He knelt beside her bed. Nancy was lying on the bed. She was looking at the ceiling and crying at that moment. Why are you crying? Kelly asked her. Imagine, you're walking around. Everyone recognizes you, saying hello, talking about something, and you don't remember or know anyone. She wiped her eyes with a towel that was lying there. Don't worry, everything will be fine. Vita replied. After that, they started coming to the woman every day, bringing something, talking. Nancy already recognized them, but sometimes she still had to remind her who came to her. After a week, Mason came running into her room and told her that her mom had had surgery and was doing much better than she had before. They went into Lisa's room together. She was Mason herself. Yes, and Nancy were all happy because it had turned out this way and not any other way. That's when James came in. Nancy, I got a message from the ER that you did everything you could to keep that woman alive, looking at her and smiling. Yes, that's what they said. Confirmed what Mason said. And how did you manage that with your illness? The head doctor wondered then. I don't know. But the moment I saw her eyes roll back and she went practically white, she stopped breathing. It was like my brain shut down and my hands started doing everything. The woman was telling him, yeah, it's true what they say. It's like riding a bike. Once you learn how to ride a bicycle, you can do it all your life. James smiled. He walked over to Nancy, put his arm around her shoulders, and there are visitors again. He said to her, Jacob, the woman said. She already remembered him and knew him. Yes, your grandson and his fiancée, James said. Oh, then I must go to them. She looked at Lisa. She blinked in agreement. When she went out into the hallway, she saw Jacob and Kelly sitting outside her room. Grandma, what are you doing there? Jacob asked her. He was getting worried again. A very good friend of mine is lying here. I lived with her until I didn't know who I was, where I was, and where I should go, she confessed to him. All right, let's go and talk, and then we'll go to your acquaintance and thank her for doing everything for you," said her grandson to her. They went into the woman's room, laid out everything they had brought, and Jacob told her the most welcome news of all, perhaps the one Nancy had been waiting for all these years. I called my parents yesterday, and they said they're coming to visit us in two weeks. He muttered to her. Jacob didn't have the breath to utter it. That's why he was interrupting. God, what happiness Nancy clapped her hands. Though she couldn't even remember her son's face, but it didn't matter now. The main thing was that they came and everything else could be left for later. 
Well, let's go meet your acquaintance, Jacob said to her. And they went to the room where Lisa was lying. When they got there, Kelly just froze at the door. Why come in? Jacob told her. It was the first time he had seen his girlfriend afraid or shy. I can't, she answered, and turned away. She seemed to want to get out. Why? He didn't understand. Because it's my mom, Kelly told him. She was surprised herself. It was impossible to even find the words. Like what? Mason jumped up from his seat. Kelly, you're the one he couldn't believe his eyes. Mason looked at her brother and could not believe that he was already so big. Lisa opened her eyes and in that instant she cried. It had been so many years since she had seen her daughter to meet her now. Mommy, what's wrong? Kelly came up to her. She didn't know what to do. And she was afraid that she'd just gotten out of surgery. What if it hurts? Daughter, please forgive me for everything. She exhaled. They hugged. I have nothing to forgive you for. They both cried, because it's not every day that situations like this happen. Wow. Jacob looked at that hug. What are you so surprised about? Nancy turned to him. How could it be that your mother was the one who got my grandmother after you took her to the store? Said the young man. They were all sitting in Lisa's room. Mason climbed onto his sister's lap. That's when James walked in. Oh, I see you two have already bonded. He said to them, that's the word. And they told him who was who. Wow, that's fate, he said. But you don't know the most important thing. Your grandmother probably didn't tell you that. Not only did she live with Lisa, but she saved her life, the man said. What do you mean? Nancy doesn't remember anything. Kelly didn't realize at that moment. That's it. If it hadn't been for your grandmother, you would never have met your mom again, the doctor said. A month later, Charles and Miranda arrived as promised. When they entered Nancy's house, they immediately started hugging her. Who are you? She looked at her son with surprise. Mom, why don't you recognize me? Charles kissed her on both cheeks. Tears ran down her cheeks. Son, she said, as if trying to guess who had come to see her. Yes, I'm sorry for all the times I didn't come. For leaving you with this dummy. She looked at Jacob. Nancy, am I glad to see you? Miranda hugged her. The woman looked at her as if she were a specimen in a museum. Charles and Jacob went to see James the next day. They wanted to know what to do about the mother. You know, guys, this process, if it starts, you can only maintain the condition. You have to live with it. If it is a mild stage, which I think she is now, then she will remember in places, talk and do. But if it goes to severe, then brace yourself and your mom and grandmother's heart is strong. So don't get your hopes up. He fell silent because there was a knock on the door. It was Kelly. She was very surprised to see her young man here. What are you doing here? He came up to her and said in a whisper, wait, I need to talk to James. She looked at the man. Yak, yeah, come on in. I'm listening. I hope you don't have any secrets from each other said the man. I'm not the only one Kelly wheeled her mother into the study. Mason walked in as well. I think you're on the same subject as we are. Lisa looked at Jacob. We're about grandma, he told her, and I'm about her. You see, what happened to her is terrible, of course. But imagine the body's abilities, what it can do when it's in shock, Lisa said. It was quiet now, almost a whisper, but everyone could hear her well. And what was James looking at her for? I would like Nancy to continue living with us. She's used to us in the house knows everything. Mason thinks of her as a grandmother. She turned to Charles. But that's up to you. The doctor shrugged. All right. Now that all the medications have been administered, we should all get together, Charles said. They went back to the house. Lisa and Mason were with him. They ran through to Nancy what they had just said in the doctor's office. She smiled and hugged Mason. Well, mom, what will your choice be? Charles looked at her. Of course I will move, since they have become like family to me. And Jacob will salt and let them stay here. The woman cried. The son put everyone in the car. He drove his mother to the place where she was to live. 
After that he got out of the car and helped the mother to get out. They went up to the floor, entered the apartment. This place could use some repairs, the man said. Will you do it? The mother asked him. And if I hire workers and buy the materials, you are very offended at me. He looked into the eyes of the one who had once put her whole life into raising him. His mother looked at him once. He took her by the shoulders. I'm kidding. How could I forget you? You're the dearest and dearest thing in my life. I just have to show up more often, or she'll forget. Nancy smiled. I've already thought of that. Charles stopped talking. Well, it's okay, they hugged. And then, while the parents were here, Kelly invited Jacob over to her mother's house, where his grandmother was as well. Charles and Miranda drove up as well. There the young man was getting ready to propose. Just please be happy, the grandmother said. How are we? Miranda smiled and kissed her husband. No, you shouldn't leave your children behind either, he threatened. Charles fingered the future boyfriend of the newlyweds. It's gonna be okay. Kelly was hugging her mother at that moment. She didn't understand how she could have left her then. And most importantly, she hadn't thought about it for so many years. She felt the same way she did now. When did grandma get lost? The young went to the registry office. There they wrote everything they wanted. They were to be married in a month. How good it is to be young and happy. Nancy said, Grandma, don't be sad. Jacob came up to her. The groom's father had bought him and the bride fancy wedding suits. No one was mad at anyone. Basically, everyone was to blame for what happened. Now everyone has forgiven each other. No one held a grudge. Do you agree? Did the woman at the front desk speak? Yes, Kelly did. Yes. Jacob looked at her. They congratulated each other with a kiss and then twirled in the first wedding dance. Your grandmother will soon be a great grandmother. You whispered in Kelly Jacob's ear. Were you seriously looking at your favorite? You think it's something to joke about? She leaned away from him and looked into his eyes. How long have you two been dancing? Charles approached them. It's okay. Jacob answered him. They went to the restaurant. While they were talking, the groom came up to the grandmother and kissed her. Who are you? Nancy looked at him. Hi. He realized she was joking with him. The woman had gotten used to it lately. She squeezed his hand and kissed it. I wish you well. Tears rolled from her eyes. I have an announcement to make. Getting up from his seat at last, we are listening to you, his father told him. There's a new addition to our family, and my grandmother will change her status, as will you and my parents. He looked over to where Nancy was sitting. Thank you. She sent him a kiss. Subscribe and click the bell. You're five years old. Daughter, congratulations, mom exclaimed, entering the living room, where at the festive table gathered all the relatives, headed by the birthday girl. In her hands she held a huge cake, on which burned five candles. Well, come on, my girl make the most cherished wish and try to overnight all the candles, pronounced daddy, hugging the girl by the shoulders. I want. She thought for a second and looked around at everyone present. I want that we never parted loudly, said the girl and almost whispered at it. And also this beautiful doll that we saw in the store. This one asked the grandmother and, opening the closet, took out the very doll that Evelyn had recently seen in the store and squeezed her mother's ears. What a big and beautiful toy it was and how Evelyn would like it. But then her mother had been adamant, noting that they wouldn't spend that much money on such an expensive toy. Seeing the gift, little Evelyn was confused at first. She froze in place and looked at the doll and at her grandmother. I still can't believe what is happening. Honey, you're not happy. Grandpa asked, why are you frozen? Birthday wishes should always come true. Evelyn smiled and clapped her hands in delight. She ran up to her grandmother and held out her arms in anticipation of the gift. When the cherished doll was in her arms, she looked at her grandparents and whispered grandma and grandpa, you are the best in the world. Cindy and David, next time, consult with us.
Before you give such expensive gifts, are you spoiling Evelyn? And admonished the pensioners in a disgruntled voice, the mother of the birthday girl. And I don't think we should indulge a girl's every whim. But her husband's parents disagreed. Maria, who else should we spoil? Grandpa stepped in. Who knows what will happen tomorrow and how long we have left. And what's wrong with a child to be happy? Especially she is our only granddaughter added the mother-in-law. Evelyn was used to such conversations. She paid no attention to these words because all her thoughts were already in the yard with her favorite doll. The girls would burst with envy. No one has such a thing, reflected, smiling girl. Maria sighed heavily. She had nothing to say. She lived here on a bird's license. Her mother-in-law ran the apartment. Maria had met William at a friend's party eight years ago. The guy fell in love with her, and as they say, at first sight. At that time, Maria had a young man whom she dreamed of marrying, but only this young man had completely different priorities. As he himself told her more than once, he hadn't piled on yet. What was the point of rushing into it? Maybe we're not right for each other. He explained to her while he looked around. Actually, I'm 21. Maria insisted. It's time for a family and, and kids. Why procrastinate? Especially since we've been together for two years. But he ignored all her arguments. Maria was angry, but she was patient and waited. Suddenly, she was invited to a birthday party in a tomb. There were a lot of people at the party, and William was among them. He immediately attracted attention. The girl stood out too much from the crowd. Despite the fact that he was tall, handsome, polite, and expensively dressed, which spoke of his rather financial condition. But for all that, he was very shy, but even his modesty did not prevent him from asking Maria out on a date. And on the second date, he asked her to marry him. Maria was well aware that she had no feelings for him, but she really wanted to take revenge on her ex. Therefore, without thinking, she gave her consent. And in a month and a half, the girl stood in the registry office, in white, five, and mind-blowing wedding dress. Everything as it should be. Then a motorcade of several cars drove them around the city, and all the girlfriends were bursting with envy. Yes, Maria, you're lucky to get a guy with money and an apartment. Yeah. Well, what are you gonna do with your parents? They're not forever. But in the center of the city, you'll live like Christ at your side. They told each other. After the ceremony, the newly wedded couple flew to the sea and a whole week enjoyed the sound of the surf and basked under the hot sun on the hot white sand. Maria was over the moon with happiness, but the euphoria quickly passed and the reality remained. Back home, they plunged headlong into everyday cares. William was at work all day long. Maria was finishing her degree in knitwear. The spouses saw each other only at breakfast and dinner when William came home. But Maria was satisfied with this state of affairs. Finishing her studies, she met every day with her girlfriends. Did they gossip in cafes or sing karaoke? She met her ex a couple times. He held the hand of his new party and pretended not to even know Maria. His indifference was a terrible blow to the girl's ego. And she vowed to herself, in spite of you, I'll be the happiest woman in the world. The young couple lived in the center of the city in a two-bedroom with William's parents. The apartment, of course, was not huge, but there was plenty of space. The big room was given to the young, and in the smaller one the owners themselves organized. My mother-in-law continued to run the household, and Maria was very happy about it. You have your whole life ahead of you to prepare and clean. Maria's mother-in-law kept saying, Children will go quickly, all you learn to cook and wash and iron. And while there is time, enjoy life. Maria liked this life very much. After graduating from technical school with a specialty, she decided not to go anywhere and went to work as a clerk in the nearest store to the house. Paid, of course, a little, but it was enough for little girls. Weekend, she went with her friends to the disco periodically acquired. William did not say a word to her. He himself was happy to see his young wife happy and satisfied. And his friends couldn't stop admiring him. 
You could only dream of such a thing. They talked about William. He doesn't limit anything, doesn't reproach anything, doesn't forbid anything, doesn't yell Maria. Should you carry him in your arms? Oh no, he should thank all the gods that I met on his way. Laughed the young woman in response. Few people would agree to live with a mother-in-law and mother-in-law. Come on, your mother-in-law is a saint, exclaimed back her friends. On such a one only pray. Well, then pray, parried Maria. I'd rather live separately, but it's probably more convenient for my William. With sadness in her voice, cried the woman. A year after the marriage, Maria realized she was pregnant. William was incredibly happy. He literally carried his wife in his arms. Cindy and David were anxiously waiting for their granddaughter to be born. They worried about their daughter-in-law, did not allow her to do anything, so that she would not suddenly get tired. They controlled her diet, her sleep. Mother-in-law freed her from all the household chores, although in principle Maria and before did not help much. And she was fine with it. But still, every chance she got, she reminded me. The apartment is not mine. What right do I have to manage and change anything? When Evelyn was born, and Maria didn't feel very excited when you were pregnant, you thought you were ready for motherhood. And when the baby girl came into the world, she was a very annoying young mother. I didn't realize she would need so much of my attention. She took up all of my free time, and she was soul-crushing. Maria friend, everyone said that the first year, the baby only sleeps. But that's not really the case. Not only does she wake up with the roosters and nice outside during the day, but at night she wants to play. Can you believe it? And I'm exhausted. I want to sleep too. And the figure of a girl, look at what I look like. Instead of breasts, there's some kind of sacks. Her stomach hangs. Maria, we don't understand. We don't understand, her friends objected. Your mother-in-law is dusting you off. All you have to do is raise your daughter, and that's all you do. That's easy for you to say, William. He doesn't help me at all. A girl comes home from work and goes to bed. She plays with her daughter for maybe 15 minutes, and that's it. That's interesting. So you want your husband to work and take care of your daughter. And what will you do? Sleep. I don't know, but my daughter's not just mine, she's ours. That means that both of us have to take care of her. Time flew by. Evelyn grew up. She learned to play on her own and sleep longer. Maria went back to work, and she was glad she did. Every day in the mornings, she took the girl to daycare and flew to work. In the evenings, she did not hurry home. She liked to sit and gossip with her friends, drink tea, discuss the latest news. She didn't worry about the girl, because she was sure that her father or grandparents would come for her. Evelyn did not reach for her mother and did not miss her unnecessarily. She loved her father madly. And about the grandparents there is nothing to say. The child simply idolized them. And those in return did not dote on his granddaughter. William also adored the girl, but because of work could not give her much time. But when in those rare free moments they went out for a walk or to have fun, Little Evelyn remembered it all for a long time and remembered at any opportunity. And recently he promised to give her a small kitten. Evelyn clapped her hands in delight, but she immediately blew it off. Mom probably won't let him, she said quietly, looking into her father's eyes. Well, let's not tell her anything yet, and we'll see. Maybe I can talk her into it, Dad promised. The day before her birthday, Evelyn and her parents went shopping for a new dress. And that's when she noticed the beautiful doll that stood on the highest shelf. While her mother tried on her cover and twirled the girl in all directions to assess how well the new outfit fit, the girl kept her eyes on the toy. If you want, you can choose another dress, which you like the most, smiling, offered Maria. Can I not have a dress? I'll have a doll. Of course not. Immediately, the mother replied with a refusal. Look how much it costs. No toy can cost that much money. It's not gold after all. But the grandparents decided to fulfill the dream of their only granddaughter. 
and the girl was so happy. She had already decided to go to the street to show her friends a new doll. As suddenly froze on the threshold and listened, her attention was attracted by a quiet squeak that came from the bedroom. Putting the doll on the floor, she decided to check what the sound was. Looking into the room, the girl saw a huge box with a bow in the center. Quickly opening it, she shrieked in surprise. Inside the dolls was a tiny gray kitten. Evelyn immediately ran out of the room and threw herself around her father's neck. Are you the best daddy in the world? She whispered in his ear, simultaneously wiping away tears of joy with her small palms. Then she rushed back and pulled her pet out of the box. The girl gently cuddled him to her and closed her eyes. This is the best birthday ever, she whispered. And when Evelyn left for the yard, Maria let her emotions run wild. You could have consulted me. I understand that my opinion doesn't matter to you. One gave an expensive doll, the other brought this furry monster. The woman was offended that her gifted dress was the one the girl liked the least. She almost cried with resentment. I want to remind you that I'm raising her alone. I'm trying to raise her to be a human being. All you can do is pamper her and let all my labor go to waste. And then Cindy, Maria, came to her son's defense. Her tone was steady and calm. Can't you rejoice with us with your daughter? Instead, you're only on her birthday. What's so terrible about a child's wishes being fulfilled? Your dress is also incredibly beautiful, but you have to realize that she's only five years old. And at that age, she likes toys more than outfits. That's not the point. The daughter-in-law was falling apart more and more. It's just that you all try at every opportunity to point out to me that I'm a bad mother, a worthless wife and mistress. But here you are wrong. Maria calmed her mother-in-law. Just by virtue of youth and inexperience, you do not yet understand many things. But all this will come with the years. So you're saying I'm not capable of anything. Maria, stop yelling at mom. William suddenly spoke up. We're living in their apartment with everything. They're the ones helping Evelyn and me. And you have to admit, without my parents, it would be a little difficult. Evelyn spends most of her time with them. You have no right to raise your voice to your mom. Have you ever wondered why I still live here? Maria turned to her husband, because my husband is so comfortable with mommy. He hasn't even tried to get his own place. Every day I hear people saying we have to wait. We have to be patient. It'll be here soon. Yeah, I've been living on your promises for years. How much longer do I have to wait? William was silent. Cindy and David watched their son with a measure of sympathy, and after a little silence, the man said, It's a shame. I wanted to give you an anniversary present. A surprise, so to speak. But I guess I'll have to give up that idea. I've got the money for the apartment. I've saved up. This weekend, we can drive around and see what's available. Maria was speechless with surprise, and immediately there was no trace of resentment. She instantly cheered up, ran up to her husband, and threw herself on his neck. His parents left the room, leaving the couple alone. They were really happy for their son, that at last he would be able to buy his own place. But it was still unsettling. They understood perfectly well that Maria is not ready for an independent life, but maybe she will learn everything faster. My father-in-law said, we can only believe it, nodded his wife. William and Maria soon bought a one bedroom in a residential area, but the young wife was happy about that too. During the move, she only kept talking about how the girlfriends would get a place to live, but she was not happy for long. Independent life without her husband's parents was not so simple. Now Maria in the morning not only hurried with her daughter to kindergarten, but in the evenings took her away from there because William did not have time to do it. And when she came home, she didn't go to her room to rest, but hurried to the kitchen to prepare dinner for the weekend in nonstop mode, when she had to do an incredible number of things in just two days. She didn't even want to remember. The woman had forgotten the last time she had gone out with her friends. Nerds were on the limit, and they scandalized her and her husband constantly, and for any reason. Maria often took it out on little Evelyn. And as a result, 
The girl became silent and withdrawn. Once at work, Maria's colleagues decided to organize a corporate party. Maria warned William in advance that today he had to pick up Evelyn from daycare. William agreed and left for work. In the evening, Maria's phone was ready to explode with calls. William and her mother-in-law tried to call her alternately, but Maria persistently did not pick up the phone. She realized that now she would have to go to kindergarten to pick up her daughter and disrupt her corporate event. But when an unfamiliar number popped up on her cell phone, the woman answered, Maria, are you picking up Evelyn? The garden has been closed for half an hour already. The kindergarten teacher expressed her dissatisfaction. I'm on my way, muttered Maria. In response, and glancing at her watch, hailed a cab. All the way she tried to call her spouse, but his phone was disconnected. After apologizing to the disgruntled kindergarten teacher and gathering her daughter quickly, she went outside. On her way home, she pushed Evelyn up every now and then, dragging her by the arm. The girl could barely keep up with her irritated mother. She heard her mother cursing at her father, calling him selfish, irresponsible, a worthless husband, and a disgusting father. And as they approached the driveway, suddenly the phone rang again. Looking at the screen, she saw that it was her mother-in-law. What do you all want from me? She whispered out of breath, angry at having disrupted the party. Yes, barked the woman into the phone. Maria's unhappy. Or an old woman. William's been hospitalized. I don't understand you at all. Can you explain what happened? Maria asked, not hiding the irritation in her voice. William was in a car accident. She tried to explain clearly, swallowing her tears. He's in surgery now. I've been calling you all evening, but I couldn't get through. Maria left Evelyn with a neighbor and rushed to the hospital. The doctor met her there and informed her that William had died without regaining consciousness on the operating table. Injuries incompatible with life. They did everything they could. It took Maria a while to realize what the doctor had said. The woman looked at her husband's parents, sitting in an embrace on the couch. Cindy was roaring in her voice, and David, pale as a sheet, was clasping his grief-stricken wife. The whole week that followed was a blur. Black robes, lots of sad people, most of them strangers, and suddenly no one. Empty in the apartment, empty in Evelyn's soul, the only reminder of the past. The girl was more withdrawn than ever. She like a shadow wandered around the apartment, moving silently, and in her little heart settled universal sadness. But time does not stand still. Gradually Maria came to terms with the loss. Unlike her daughter, who missed her daddy madly until now. The girl spent all her time playing with the cat that her father had once given her. The grandparents supported the granddaughter as best they could and often took her to their home together with her father. Only their care and love helped the little girl to come back to life. And when Evelyn went to school, Maria brought her suitor to the house. Let's get acquainted. She introduced her daughter to him. This is my daughter, Evelyn. And this is Uncle Mark. He will now live with us, which means that he is now your daddy. The girls were not thrilled with their mother's new acquaintance. He was short, unshaven. He was the exact opposite of William. The man reluctantly extended his hand to the girl, but the girl responded by hiding her palm behind her back and whispering, My daddy died. And soon Uncle Mark moved his things out. The relationship with Evelyn was not getting better. The girl did not want a strange man to live with them. And on the shelves of the father lay his things, but no one was interested in the opinion of the little girl. The mother was completely dissolved in the new relationship. She tried her best to please the gaggle, forgetting all about her daughter. Cindy and David were worried about their granddaughter. They saw how Evelyn treated her mother's roommate. They often took the girl to their house. Well, it was not as often as they would have liked. And soon Maria announced that she was pregnant and that she and Mark had decided to get married. And when Mark began to live in their apartment on the legal grounds of the spouse, then for Evelyn began an unbearable life. Stepfather constantly scolded the girl, punished for every little thing. And the mother turned a blind eye to everything, supporting the methods of education of the new husband. 
After a while, the family became bigger by one little man, who was named Vanessa. And all the attention of Maria and Mark was riveted to her. All their free time they tried to spend together with the little girl. And when the mother needed to do something around the house, Evelyn played the role of a nanny. At such moments, Evelyn looked at the baby's tiny hands and fingers with curiosity. She talked to her and gently stroked her head, which was covered with a delicate tuft of hair instead of hair. Evelyn had no jealousy or dislike for her little sister. She believed that when Vanessa grew older, they would surely be friends. As time went on, the stepfather and stepdaughter relationship never got better. Evelyn's presence. Mako was annoyed, and he didn't even hide it. And one day, Evelyn overheard her mother and stepfather talking. Are you out of your mind? Maria was indignant. Where can I put her? I propose to sell this apartment because one room for everyone is not enough. We'll buy a two or three. Then the problem with your daughter will solve itself, Mark reasoned. But that's impossible. I must get the consent of my father-in-law and mother-in-law, replied the woman. Here are their shares after her husband's death. Well, then we must explain to them that we're all cramped in here. Mark insisted. When they saw Colia, they were immediately able to. And a couple of days later, when Maria brought Evelyn to her grandparents to visit, she decided to talk to them about it. After listening carefully to her daughter-in-law, her mother-in-law asked, Maria, do you know for sure that you will find a place for Evelyn in the new apartment? What do you mean by that? The woman was surprised. I'm suggesting another option. My father-in-law entered the conversation. You're going to take out a mortgage anyway, right? So let us buy out your share, and that way everybody's happy. You get the down payment, and we get the memory of our son. Maria didn't like that offer. She planned to get the whole apartment, but on the faces of the elderly couple realized that they would not agree to more. So she nodded in agreement. Cindy and David sold their favorite Dacia, where they spent a lot of time in the summer car and garage. The proceeds, it was enough to buy out Maria's share and Evelyn's share. Maria was surprised, counting the money they received. Evelyn, this apartment will be a gift from us when the girl grows up, Cindy clarified. Mark was the most unhappy about the whole situation. Then let your daughter stay here. The man did not stop resenting. Otherwise, I'll take her to the army and dress her, and then she'll burst into flames and go to her apartment. And she won't even say a kind word to me. I'll be paying this mortgage for the rest of my life. And these juvenile runaways are already in and out of the apartment. Mark, I couldn't change anything. I tried to justify myself. Don't be mad. We'll make money. We'll pay it off quickly. What are you going to earn? Igor started a husband in his store with our income, as if not to starve. But I want to remind you that the idea of a spacious apartment was yours, Maria smiled. Who knew that this house was not yours, admitted her husband. If I had known, I wouldn't have been here. Mark, what are you talking about? Maria was frightened. I don't believe that you're with me only because of the apartment. No, don't worry about it. I didn't mean it like that. The man came to his senses and took his little daughter in his arms and ran up to him. He adored Vanessa. It's just that this injustice makes me angry. So one of your daughters has an apartment and the other one's broke. But Vanessa has a father. And Evelyn only got an apartment from her father, Maria Parried. They ended up buying. They are two room. One room was allocated to the parents and the second served as a bedroom for the girls. The sisters grew up amicably. The older sister gladly took care of the younger one and the younger one paid the older one with her love which Evelyn lacked in her new family. Evelyn still paid no attention to her except when she needed to be scolded or punished for something. We had always been cool to Evelyn, and with the birth of her daughter, she had grown cold to her. And one day, when Evelyn was in sixth grade, the girl came home earlier than usual. Mom was at work at the time and Vanessa was at daycare. The stepfather had been staying at home for a few days. He had recently been fired from his old job and was on the lookout for a new one. Upon entering the apartment, 
Evelyn was struck by the woman's shoes at the door. Her mom had never seen those before. Seeing the loss, Mark became furious. Why are you here so early? He shouted. Lessons are not over yet. Our teacher got sick and canceled. Evelyn excused herself for the last class, staring at the unfamiliar shoes. And we have someone visiting. No, they're the neighbor's shoes. She was just leaving, the stepfather replied, noticing the direction of his stepdaughter's gaze in the room. Evelyn obediently went to her room. After seeing her off, Mark went to her room. You've got a lot of homework. Evelyn looked at her stepfather. It was the first time the man asked her about her studies for all the years of living together. No, the girl answered. Evelyn, you see, the man was hesitating, obviously choosing his words. You probably do not tell your mother that the neighbor came. Otherwise, she'll just make up stuff. What is there to make up? The girl didn't understand. Nothing. It's very simple. Don't tell everything. Evelyn did as Mark asked her but it did not escape her attention, that the relationship between stepfather and mother had become somewhat strained. They were often scandalized, accusing each other of every mortal sin. It was not uncommon for the girls to get into trouble if they got in the way. Evelyn stayed with her grandparents more and more often because that's where she was loved. And once, when the house was quiet after another scandal, Evelyn took a suitcase and put her things in it told her mother, Sile, I have no more patience for your husband. I'm tired of your constant bickering. Now I will live where I am loved and expected. Maria calmly accepted this fact, and deep down she felt relieved. At first she didn't even ask her mother-in-law how her eldest daughter was feeling. Evelyn didn't waste any time. She tightened her studies, corrected all the bad marks, which recently became more and more. Teachers also noticed positive changes in the girl. She began to smile more often. She cheered up, and Evelyn did not even remember her mother. The only person she missed was her little sister. By graduation, Evelyn had already decided what she wanted to be in the future, and her choice was a psychologist. Yes, I've made up my mind, she told her grandparents, especially since our university has a department of psychology and I found out. Well, it's not a bad choice, supported granddaughter David. Psychology is a serious science, agreed Cindy. But Maria, hearing about her daughter's decision, frankly laughed. Is it a profession to work, a vest for strangers? She expressed her opinion. Don't you have enough problems of your own? You're digging into other people's problems. Why are you doing this? Evelyn's mother's reaction didn't surprise her. She, probably, in her heart of hearts was prepared for the fact that her parents would not support her. After all, her mother ridiculed all her ideas from childhood and called them delusional. Well, at least I can understand you, explained the daughter. Why do you so much time looking into the mouth of a man who does not put you in anything? How can you love him more than your own children? How can you have the conscience to say such things? The woman was outraged. Mark raised you. Replaced your daddy. Vanessa adores him. Everybody fights. That's how life works. Mom, do you really mean that? Evelyn was surprised. He's a bum who sits on his neck all the time. He can love, but not me. And he could never replace my daddy. Your husband is a total Alfonso. A womanizer and an egomaniac. He's no match for daddy. It's your choice and you have to live with it and I have no right to judge you, but don't glorify him in my eyes. I'm not blind. Listening to the eldest daughter Maria from indignation could not utter a word. And when she was silent, he only gritted his teeth. How ungrateful you are. But Evelyn only smiled at that. She remembered that she had never regretted it since she had left her mother's house. But why should we? The girl was unfazed. I am immensely grateful to my daddy from whom I got wonderful genes. I am immensely grateful to my grandparents, who loved me and put their souls into me, taught me forgiveness, and most importantly to appreciate what you have. I am even grateful to you for giving me life many years ago, and most importantly for not talking me out of leaving you back in the day. 
I am grateful to Vanessa, who loves me and sees me as a human being, unlike you and your husband. But I have nothing to be grateful to a stranger who came to our house on the spot and did nothing to earn my trust and favor. Maria remained silent, and only with a frown at her daughter, she left the apartment. Evelyn entered the psychology program. She was very happy with her choice and graduated from the institute with a red diploma. Next, Evelyn, several other graduates, as the best students were sent for internship in one of the centers of psychological help to people who found themselves in a difficult life situation. The girl was incredibly grateful to fate that she got such a chance. Cindy and David were proud of their granddaughter and at the graduation decided to give her their gift. Evelyn, her grandmother addressed her. You know that your grandfather and I love you madly and want only one thing, for you to be happy. We are proud of you and hope that you will continue to develop in the same direction you have grown and are ready for independent life. So we decided Grandma paused to brush away the tears that were running. We decided to sign over your father's apartment to you. Grandpa came to the rescue. Evelyn couldn't believe everything that was happening as she stood in the very apartment where she had once been very happy. I thought it had been sold, she admitted. Mom had told me that they had put the money from its sale as a down payment on the apartment they were living in now. Yes, we bought her share then, David admitted. So that's why you're left without a car and garage. Evelyn guessed, and we don't regret it. Smiled Cindy. You're our joy. You're all we have left, William. So please accept our gift as a token of our undying love for you. Thank you. Through tears, Evelyn thanked them. I love you too. You are my most dear people in this world. Soon, Evelyn moved into a new apartment. It was harder to visit her grandparents every day, but she called them every day to check on their health. Having finished her internship at the Psychological Help Center, Evelyn was offered to stay there to work. The salary, of course, is not very big, but you will get an incredible experience, said the head of the center holding out the employment contract for her to sign. Evelyn, not thinking long, agreed. During the year, she got used to the team. But most of all, she liked to help people. After all, it was thanks to her efforts that people became happier. And from this realization, she got inexplicable pleasure. Vanessa often visited her older sister. From her, Evelyn learned news from home, although it was hard to call it news. In her mother's family, everything was the same. Mark was still out of work, but he claimed to be on the lookout for a decent job. I've even seen him with other women a couple of times, Vanessa admitted. I think he's cheating on mom. Vanessa, don't you worry about that. Her sister advised her, the parents will figure it out. It's not a big deal to pry into a couple's relationship. Believe me, it's a thankless task. Vanessa nodded in agreement. Do you mind if I crash at your place tonight? The school canceled classes for tomorrow, the little sister explained. We're going to the exhibition. No problem then, Evelyn said happily. Such evenings, the sisters stayed up late. They had something tasty for dinner and talked for a long time, drinking tea with candy. Vanessa shared her secrets with her sister and asked her opinion. She asked for advice, shared her plans for life. Evelyn listened to her with pleasure. She liked that despite their different fathers and age difference, they were very close. On the day of her 25th birthday, Evelyn did not organize a lavish party, but decided to celebrate modestly with her family. All were invited, except for her stepmother. But her mother, citing indisposition, also did not come, congratulating her daughter on the phone. Vasileva sat all evening was not herself, did not answer questions, all the time translating the topic of conversation. We'll marry you off to a reliable man, then you can die with peace of mind, David said. Grandpa, what are you talking about? His granddaughter stopped him. You have great grandchildren to nurse. God willing. God willing. Cindy whispered softly. But fate had its own plans for her. Six months later, her grandfather died of a heart attack and her grandmother outlived her husband by only one year. But before she died, she made a will for Evelyn. To Evelyn's surprise, Maria showed up at her mother-in-law's funeral. 
In all these years, they had not spoken to each other. She hadn't been to her grandfather's funeral either. And this is a surprise. I'm glad you're here, thanked her eldest daughter. How could I leave you at a time like this? Replied the mother. And here everything is the same. She said, looking around. The wallpaper has just been changed, and the furniture is still the same. Mom, what are you talking about? You couldn't believe your ears, could you, Evelyn? The same thing. Mother explained with a shrug. It's been so many years since your father and I left this apartment, and it feels like yesterday. You could change the furniture. I don't think this is the time to discuss it, Evelyn said. And I want to remind you that my grandparents took care of me, fed, and clothed me. And you cut me out of your life. As soon as the front door slammed behind me, oh, don't push it, Maria waved me off. I was always thinking about you, but I realized that you'd be better off here. A month later, her mother came to Evelyn's house to have tea and cake, which surprised the eldest daughter incredibly. What a surprise. Evelyn couldn't help pouring the tea. Did something happen? Maria asked her nonchalantly, I'm your mother after all. Can I just visit my own daughter? No, of course you can. It's just strange why the thought never occurred to you in the past few years. She admitted it, but it still feels good. Maria silently looked around, as if in between asked, what will you do with the apartment? Nothing noble, I'll move here. You're alone. Why do you need a two-room apartment? Well, first of all, it's not just an apartment for me, Evelyn explained. This is my home. It's where I grew up, where I was happy. And two, it's in the center of town. It's a five-minute walk to work. And after a little silence, her mother asked again, and one room it will be empty. No, Evelyn assured her, I'll rent it out. The mother's face showed that she was not satisfied with her eldest daughter's plans. Soon Evelyn renovated the one-bedroom apartment as she had planned and moved in, renting out the studio. At this point, Vanessa was already in her first year of college. Maria continued to meet regularly with her eldest daughter. Her plan was to get Evelyn to sign the apartment over to Vanessa. Why would I give my apartment to Vanessa? I didn't see what Evelyn had to do with it. But you two are friends. She's your little sister, you know, she's your younger sister. Maria's older daughter. That's selfish of you. I inherited the apartment from my father. Vanessa has her own father, so let him worry about his daughter's future. Evelyn, well, you know very well that Mark can't offer her anything, her mother persuaded her. But seeing that Evelyn was adamant, she went for broke. And to be fair, the apartment is also mine, so I'm also an heiress and have a share in it. I did, agreed the daughter, until she sold it to her grandparents, and their will was, do you like it or not, and I will not violate it. Yes, mother, you certainly are. Mark was indignant. You can't even reason with your own daughter. What can I do? It's all according to the law, answered Maria. Both apartments she inherited. I'm powerless. And what does the law have to do with it? When it's about family, the man insisted. Where does she need so many apartments? Is she going to salt them or what? Why couldn't she live in a one-room apartment? She could have given her sister a two-bedroom. Especially since Vanessa is getting married. Kids will be here soon. Where can we fit everything in here? I, for one, don't want to share an apartment with a strange man. Well, your suggestions. I've talked to Evelyn many times, but she just keeps saying what's mine, and that's it. So we'll just have to play it cool if she won't take the easy way out. Mark suggested it. She's renting out a one-bedroom, and she doesn't care who she rents it to. So she should rent it to Vanessa. What difference does that make? Maria didn't understand. Evelyn wouldn't charge her own sister. Her conscience won't allow it, the mayor explained. And if her conscience allows it, then in a couple of months we'll say there's no money. Young family so-and-so. Evelyn will not throw Vanessa out on the street. Maria thought for a moment. Her husband was right about some things, but the whole situation was a mess. It didn't seem right, the wife hesitated. Of course it was. And when one of the sisters is bursting with wealth, and the other is starving. 
Is that right? When Vanessa came home from school, her father decided to talk to her. Daughter, mom and I consulted and came to the conclusion that it is wrong when one sister has everything and the other has nothing. I'm referring to Evelyn's apartments now, Mark explained. She'd inherited them from her father. The girl reminded him, I don't have a claim on her. Maybe you don't, but I do. The father said irritably, greed and selfishness must be cut off at the root. What do you want? I don't understand you, Vanessa asked, and the father laid out his cunning plan to his daughter. Vanessa listened carefully and turned to her mother. You agree with him. Maria is not sure. She shrugged her shoulders and then answered, but you have to live somewhere. Your James is a country boy. You can't live in a dormitory and renting is expensive. You can't afford it. It's better than all of us living here. So you've decided to take one of Evelyn's apartments. I'll find the words. I'll put Maria's daughter in her place. We're talking about your sister, exactly. And from the outside, it looks like she's our blood enemy. Vanessa retorted, Mom, Evelyn, your own daughter, is just like me. She's been through enough in her life. She's basically an orphan with her mother alive. I wouldn't wish that on her. And now you want to take away the last thing she has. What are you talking about? Maria was outraged. Yes, my father and I care about your future. And I think my father's plan is a good one. Didn't your father try to start doing something and earn his daughter a place to live? Has that idea ever occurred to you? I see dad talks a lot, but he doesn't do anything. I didn't expect you to be so mean, said Vanessa and ran out of the house. She slowly took the street and pondered on what had happened. Vanessa loved her older sister, and sometimes she didn't understand why her mother was so cold to her. What could be so wrong with the child to kick her out to live with her grandparents? Didn't her mother miss her? Didn't understand that her behavior only increased the gap between them? Many questions arose in Vanessa's mind. She walked without making out the road, and when she raised her head and looked around, she realized that she was standing in front of the center where Evelyn Vasileva worked had been here a couple of times, but then she hadn't paid any attention at all to the visitors to this establishment. Today, as she was walking up to her sister's office, she was met by several women. They were all different in age and status and in appearance, but there was one thing they had in common. In each one's eyes had a deep sadness, to say the least, a detachment. They probably lacked love too, Vanessa suggested. Sis heard, suddenly she heard Evelyn's voice behind her. What are you doing here? Inviting her guest's office, Evelyn poured tea and sat down next to her sister. Are you sad? She remarked. Did something happen with James? Did you have a fight or something with mom? No, they're fine. Vanessa reassured her sister. A more expectant look came over her, but the girl remained silent, hesitant to speak. There was a feeling that she regretted her coming. Evelyn did not insist on speaking. She silently drank tea and occasionally glanced at her sister. Olga, do you love your mother? Suddenly Vanessa asked. What a question, of course, without thinking, answered the older sister. And why did you ask about it? Well, because I always wondered why she treats us differently. The girl confessed. At one time, I even thought that you were not her own. She's always neglected you. Why? I don't know why you're bringing this up all of a sudden. Evelyn smiled. But I just thought if I had two children, I would love one less too. But Vanessa smiled at Evelyn and hugged the girl. It's wedding jitters. All mothers love their children equally, and you will love both. So why are we treated so differently? Vanessa wouldn't give up. I've often wondered about that too, Evelyn admitted. But I think my mother resents my father for leaving her alone with a baby in her arms. She shared her assumption. Well, that's silly. First of all, how can you take offense at a dead person? And secondly, what did the child have to do with it? The girls drank their tea in silence, each thinking about something else. Finally, Evelyn stood up, cleared the table, and sat down next to her sister, took her hand and said, It will be different for you. Do you and Serioza love each other? And children will be born. You will love them. And mom. 
Evelyn was silent for a few seconds and added Mama is just an unhappy woman. She should be understood and pitied. After her first marriage, she was left a young widow, and her second husband turned out to be a loser and an Alfonso. Yes, I understand everything, Vanessa replied. I love my dad, but he really, all his life lives at mom's expense. One thing I don't understand is why she put up with all this for so many years. Does she really love him? She's probably driven by fear. She's afraid of being alone, said Evelyn. But she won't be alone, and we're being childish, said Vanessa. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door, and a middle-aged woman came in. Evelyn, we need you. She disappeared as suddenly as she had appeared. I have to go. Evelyn got up from her chair and walked over to her sister. It was good to see you without filling your bright head with bad thoughts. You're going to be fine, and I'll always be here for you. And if you need anything, I'll be there for you. I never thought that my daughter was so selfish. Maria expressed her displeasure when Evelyn once again refused to give one of the apartments to her younger sister. But I guess I should have raised her better. Evelyn smirked. And the grandparents, I see, didn't do it at all. Surprised the mother. They did. But they did it as they saw fit. And you have no right to judge them. They replaced my family. Not you. Maria didn't like that kind of talk. She couldn't take criticism of herself, especially about her daughter. It probably hurt her that Evelyn was telling the truth, and Maria felt deep down guilty about her older daughter. Vanessa was preparing for the wedding. The date had already been set, invitations sent out and rings bought. But when Evelyn was offered the position of manager of the new branch of the Center for People in Difficult Situations, she hesitated. But I'd have to move to another city. I can't leave everything now, and there's a lot to leave. The director wondered, what or who's stopping you? It's not that. Evelyn was embarrassed. It's just that my little sister is getting married soon. That's fine. You'll take a walk and go. She offered to fix up the branch. Come back here in a couple years and take my place. Evelyn had no more arguments to refuse. The colleague who rented her apartment had also moved to another city. So Evelyn, knowing that the newlyweds had nowhere to live, offered them a one-room apartment. For the time being, until they solved the issue of their own housing. Vasileva was overly grateful to her sister, and the stepfather was dissatisfied. And he didn't hide it. You could have offered a two-bedroom. He grumbled. After leaving, Vanessa often called Evelyn and shared the latest news. One day, she blurted out that her mother was on sick leave. Something had Evelyn seriously worried. There was silence on the phone for a while. And then Vanessa laughed and said, don't worry, it's nothing. And after the conversation, Evelyn couldn't find room for worry. She felt that Vanessa was not telling her the whole story. Then Evelyn decided to call her mom. Maria didn't answer right away. But when she picked up the phone and heard the voice of her eldest daughter, she could hear that she was genuinely happy. She surprised her daughter. Vanessa said that you are on sick leave. Oh, under the ball also cheerfully answered the mother. A couple of sneezes, and she has already panicked. Mom, is it something serious? Don't worry, I'm fine. Why don't you tell me what's new with you? When do you plan to come back? Not for a while. The work here is just getting better. I don't think we'll be fully operational until six months from now. Mark got a job. Well, he's been moonlighting here and there. Maria was floundering. I see. So he didn't get a job. Oh, daughter, I have to go. My mother was in an unexpected hurry. You, sorry, not missing, she said and quickly hung up the phone. Evelyn listened to the short beeps for a while longer and looked at the cell phone, not understanding anything. This conversation seemed strange to her. Usually her mother was always dissatisfied, but here she was chirping cheerfully. Six months flew by for Evelyn like a day, and the work in the branch was established. After the inspection, the bosses were not stingy with compliments. Evelyn was proud of you and her team. On top of that, she had a man in her life. They met Nick at the center. He worked as an ambulance doctor and once came to a call. He saw an elderly woman who had been beaten up. 
She refused to be hospitalized, but she was too scared to stay at home. Do you think this is the first time he's beaten me? She confessed to the doctor. I'm used to both of them. But you know, this is the first time I've seen him this angry. Maybe the doctor suggested the police. Oh, no, 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 no. What are you doing? The woman was scared. He'll do time and come back. Then I'll be dead for sure. So why are you with him? The man didn't understand. Where to go? No children. No family. No friends. This Herod took everyone away. Nick felt genuinely sorry for the old woman, and he suggested that she go to the new center for helping people. Not immediately, but still she agreed. Nick drove her himself and put her in Evelyn's hands. And then several more times he stopped by the center and was interested in the well-being of his ward. The young people's working relationship quickly turned into sympathy. A month after their first meeting, Nick introduced Evelyn to his parents. Despite the fact that Nick and Evelyn were almost the same age, his parents were quite old, intelligent, courteous, pleasant to be around. They reminded Evelyn of his grandparents. And from that day on, she became a frequent visitor to their house. When are you going home? I asked Nick. Tomorrow morning. The young man's eyes immediately became sad. I'll be waiting for your return. I will quickly come to settle everything with the documents. Come back. The lovers could not part for a long time. They stood in silence and held hands. And the next day, close to lunchtime, Evelyn already reached home. Closing the door behind her, she gloried against the wall and remembered with pleasure the happy moments of life in this apartment. When her grandparents were still alive, her memories were interrupted by the phone ringing. Yes, I'm listening, she answered. Hello, sis. Vanessa's familiar voice sounded. Are you back already? Yes, I'm home. After a little silence, Vanessa said into the phone, I didn't want to tell you this, but you're going to find out anyway. Mom's in the hospital. Let's meet her off the phone. I'm going to visit her this afternoon. You're coming with me. To settle the formalities of transferring to the hometown to be the director of the help center, Evelyn met with her sister. After much hesitation, Vanessa confessed. My dad beat up my mom. She's lying there with a concussion and two more broken ribs. That's not counting the bruises, contusions and abrasions. And I'm guessing it's not the first time. Evelyn guessed. Well, yes, she'd been on sick leave a few times, so she wouldn't have to go to work with bruises. But this was her first time in the hospital. Why didn't you say anything? My mom asked me to. We filed a police report. No, that mom doesn't even want to hear about it. A nurse stopped the girls at the checkpoint. It's not allowed for two. You go. Vanessa suggested and handed her sister a robe. When Maria saw her eldest daughter, she cried. Evelyn's heart squeezed the always indifferent, always disgruntled, stern woman now looked like a wounded bird. Evelyn wanted to hug her, to hold her close, to pity her and promise that everything would get better. But she held back. She sat down next to her on the bed. The young woman inquired, How are you feeling? Well, I'm fine now. The mother replied, wiping away her tears. Maybe you can tell me what happened. Maria silently turned away to the window. Tears flowed from her eyes again. She was ashamed to admit to her daughter what had happened. Mom, I can help you, Evelyn said. But you have to want to. Maria remained silent swallowing her tears. Mom, why did Mark do it? He's been drinking lately. Finally, her mother spoke, and it was taking a lot of money. And my salary is not much. So when I turned him down, he beat me. And this time, Mark brought his drinking buddies and I refused to set the table for them. Why do you put up with it? You could leave him and live in peace. Go to the police. Don't you want to tell me you love him? I'm afraid of him. Maria confessed. I'm very afraid of him. He will never leave me alone. Let's make a report to the police first, suggested Evelyn. No. What are you afraid of, Maria? You can't even imagine how this will end. What can he do? Have you forgotten where I work? And mom, 
I listen to stories like this every day, and I know for a fact that if you sit back and take it, nothing good will come of it. Either we get him out of your life, or I'm leaving, and I'm never going to help you with this again. Maria thought for a moment, and then whispered okay, I'll do as you say. Upon learning of the statement, Mark came to his wife to confess. He swore and swore that it would never happen again, that he would work and stop drinking. But Maria, on the advice of her daughter, was adamant. After his wife's refusal, Mark instantly became furious. Losing control of himself, he began to shout and threaten to kick her out of the house. The guards chased the man out of the hospital and at Evelyn's request informed her of the incident. In the evening, she went to her stepfather's house after hearing all of his threats against her. Evelyn pulled out her phone and turned on the voice recorder, which was perfectly audible. I'll pass this on. In a calm tone of voice, she said, and if you try to carry out any of your threats, you'll go to jail for a long time. I've made sure of that. What do you want? Mark asked when he realized he was trapped. Mom's being discharged soon, Evelyn replied. She needs to rest. That's why you have three days to move out. Yeah, sure, grinned the stepmother. Look for the fool. I'm as much the boss here as she is. You forgot about Vanessa and me, Evelyn replied. You don't seem to care enough. So you've got two apartments, none of your business. You had nothing to do with my apartment or this one. You didn't put a dime into it. What's the difference? It's the law, the laws I know. It's jointly acquired property and will be divided equally. That's if you don't get locked up before you divide it. Evelyn smiled. What do you want from me? Peace March asked again. You get out of here and mom will take a statement from the police. But I have nowhere to go. Evelyn said very confused. As far as I know, you have a lot of friends. Igor first Evelyn. Ask them if they'll take you in. In the end, Evelyn, together with a lawyer from the help center, helped her mother divorce Mark and kick him out of the apartment. He spent a long time looking for arguments in his favor, but his stepdaughter's threats to put him in jail were more convincing. Having collected his things, he left on his return home. Maria took a long time to get used to the fact that she was the only one who owned the place. She also needed psychological counseling and more than one to get away from the stress. Evelyn helped her mother as much as she could. It seemed to her that during this period they had become closer than they had been in their entire lives. Her mother was genuinely happy every time her daughters came to visit. And soon Vanessa announced that she too would soon become a mother. And Maria was worried about her studies. It's no big deal. I'll take a leave of absence. In the hustle and bustle of daily life, Evelyn never got around to telling her family about Nick, despite the fact that they chatted at length on the phone every day. The man was looking forward to seeing them, but he wasn't being let go from his job, as there was a staff shortage. Evelyn had not been able to make it. Well, I can't leave my mom right now. She hasn't fully come to her senses yet, she explained. Then one day Maria invited her eldest daughter for a walk. Lately they often walked together, discussing the news. Talking about distracted topics, Maria said, Olga, I thought long and hard and came to the conclusion that I want to give Vanessa my apartment. After all, she and James are going to have a baby soon. They just need a permanent place to live. Yeah, it's your apartment. Then you can do whatever you want with it. Her daughter agreed. Evelyn wasn't going to claim her mother's place, but she felt bad that her mother didn't even think about it. Well, just for decency's sake. After all, she had her share of the apartment. Yes, you're right, nodded her mother. Vanessa will probably be pleased, but you know what I don't really want. Evelyn looked at her mother questioningly. I don't want to be a free appendix in this apartment. What do you mean by that? The daughter didn't understand. A young family should live separately, Maria explained. Maybe I can live in your apartment. Evelyn was not surprised by her mother's question. Perhaps she had expected it and was somewhat upset. It seemed to Evelyn that her mother had fully realized her mistakes and was doing her best to correct them. But as soon as she recovered from the divorce, 
she was back to her old ways. Under different circumstances, Evelyn probably would have given her mother permission. But now her resentment for her spoiled childhood, for her mother's lack of love and affection, flared up in her with renewed vigor. She turned away so that her mother would not see her weakness and said, I'm sorry, but I have other plans for my apartments. I need them. What other plans? I got angry. Maria, you wouldn't dare leave your mother on the street. I dare to remind, not long ago, I already helped you not to stay on the street, answered Evelyn turning around and looking into her mother's eyes. And I did everything possible and impossible then. And if today you've got it in your head to give the apartment to someone else, I don't hold it against you. That's your right. But it's not my fault. Well, first of all, it wasn't someone. It was your sister, Maria. And secondly, I didn't ask for help. You're the one who got involved with Mark. You're the one who pushed for our divorce and then kicked him out. Evelyn was horrified by those words. All her phantom hopes for their rapprochement and warming relationship had crumbled like a house of cards. She wanted to scream and cry herself to tears. But Evelyn, clenching her will into a fist, calmly said, I thought you didn't mind getting rid of that drunkard and tyrant who asked you to think at all. The mother parried. Before you came here, I had a husband who loved me and beat me out of love, I suppose, added Evelyn. Yes, there were disagreements between us, but like everyone else. Ignoring her daughter's words, Evelyn continued. How would you really know? You don't have a family. Her mother's last sentence caused Evelyn great heartache. Like a hurt little girl, she wanted to hurt her abuser too. So whose credit is it that I didn't have a family? She shouted out, barely holding back the tears that were choking her. My family is my grandparents. It was they who showed me what it should be without humiliation, without scandals and manhandling, where people love, respect, and appreciate each other. After listening to her daughter, the mother cooled down a bit. She tried to justify herself. It came out rather awkwardly. The woman was either reading something, but Evelyn couldn't hear her. While I believed I was helping you get rid of a tyrant husband, you've been plotting to get your hands on my inheritance, she suggested. And you know what I'm gonna tell you. Mommy, I have a fiancé. His name is Nick, and he's an EMT. We're getting married soon. He's got a job in DC, and I'm gonna transfer to his new branch of the Metropolitan Care Center. And if everything works out, we'll sell these apartments to buy one in DC. Any other questions for me? Maria stood with a confused look and didn't know what to say to her daughter. She just remained silent, looking at her and batting her eyelashes. And all we could say was, we're going to stay here. Are we staying here? Yes. Imagine, we each have our own lives. Evelyn answered and turned around and walked away from her mother. And the next morning at exactly 6 o'clock a.m., her cell phone was ringing off the book. Evelyn, I understand your mother correctly. You decided to kick us out on the street. Territory. Little sister into the phone. What are you talking about? Me. I don't understand, Evelyn clarified. I didn't quite understand exactly what she was talking about. My mom told me, Vanessa replied, that you're moving to Washington and selling all your apartments. That's true. Well, most likely, Evelyn agreed, gradually moving away from the basics. When were you planning to tell me? Suddenly shouted Vanessa. You know my situation. I'm not allowed to be nervous or anxious. And you didn't even deign to inform me that Syriosha and I would soon be homeless. I think you're being a little dramatic. Sis. Evelyn tried to calm her down. Sis. Vanessa asked her again. Yeah. A real sister wouldn't do something like that. You know very well that we have no place to live. First you invited us here, and now you want to send us away like dogs. What about selling the apartment? Don't you think that's despicable? Evelyn was finally waking up to her sister's attacks. She was uncomfortable with the tone in which Vanessa was speaking to her. I take it this is in lieu of a thank you. She clarified. I'd like to remind you that I called you in temporarily not permanently. You and James wanted a loan. Isn't that right? 
I just wanted you to keep your rent down. What mortgage are you talking about? Was Vanessa nervous? Yeah, we're struggling to make ends meet. James has time to study and work, but his salary leaves a lot to be desired. We can't even go to the movies, let alone make a big purchase. But I guess you'll have to move in with your mom. Evelyn suggested it. I don't think she'd mind. I'm sure she would. And Vanessa said, unlike you, my mom doesn't spare anything for me. She wanted to give me her apartment, but you ruined it. And how did she do that? Let me ask you something. Your selfishness. Vanessa was going, and she couldn't stop. You've been spoiled since you were a kid. You're used to everyone dancing around you. You want to study, get an apartment. You want an apartment for another one. And how do other people cope? Didn't you care? Evelyn, listening to her sister, couldn't stop wondering if her mother was so acutely ill. Vanessa couldn't have changed so much. After all, for so many years she had been an attentive, loving sister. What happened? Pretending. Thoughts swarmed through her head. Evelyn listened to the profanity and tears streamed down her cheeks. Everything she believed in and aspired to was crumbling before her eyes. The people who were closest to her had betrayed her once again. Evelyn had no desire to prove or explain anything. Taking a deep breath, she wiped away her tears and said in as calm a tone as possible, I'm sorry, sister, that I'm not what you wanted me to be, but mine will continue to be mine. And yours. Yours? And she immediately dropped the call. The clock read 600 M. There was a ringing silence. The city was slowly waking up. Evelyn kept replaying Vanessa's words in her head. Everything swam before her eyes, and she wanted to scream, but her strength was gone. Tears streamed down her face, and her heart was beating as hard as if it wanted to jump out of her chest. Evelyn was pulled out of her daze by the phone ringing. The name Mick popped up on the screen. Shaking her head, and to bring herself to her senses, she answered the call. Good morning, beloved. The young man said cheerfully hello. I hope I didn't wake you up. I have some good news. Good morning to you too, Nick. Evelyn replied, trying not to show her distressed state. I'm awake now. Did something happen to you? You've been crying. No, I'm fine. Just a little cold. But it's really bad timing. Mick lamented, and I finally settled on a transfer. He starts his new assignment in a week. I wanted to see you. You're welcome to come. I'd love to. Well, then I'll pack all my things not to return and come to you, said Nick. And you don't shell out, drink tea with raspberries. Believe me, I'll be as good as new by the time you arrive. Two days later, she met Nick at the train station. The man was glowing in part. Dropping his suitcase, he ran up to Evelyn, and taking her in his arms, began circling her in place. At last we are together. He rejoiced. Every day Nick brought his favorite breakfast in bed and greeted her with a hot dinner from work. While Evelyn was away, he fixed the faucets that had long been poking up, changed the hinges in the kitchen cabinets, hung the portrait of her with her grandparents that had been on the table for several years, sent against the wall. In short, redid all the man's chores. In the presence of Nick, Evelyn felt happy and loved. The week flew by like a single day. On the eve of departure, Nick and Evelyn took a day off. In the morning, the lovers did not live in bed for a long time. And then, while the young man went to the train station for tickets, the hostess prepared a delicious lunch. Having bolstered life, they decided to take a walk around the city. Holding hands like schoolchildren, Nick and Evelyn slowly shaved through the park, enjoying the fresh, frosty air. They were warm and cozy with each other. The time flew by. Nick invited Evelyn to the restaurant for dinner. A glass of wine, light appetizers, romantic ambience, quiet, peaceful music. Everything contributed to making this an unforgettable evening. Nick took Evelyn's hand and looked intently into her eyes. Will you marry me? Suddenly he asked, and taking advantage of the girl's interference, pulled a ring box out of his pocket. At that moment Evelyn's heart was ready to jump out of her chest. 
She had been waiting for Nick's marriage proposal for a long time and was ready to accept it. But she had no idea that this moment would be so exciting for her. She happily replied and extended her hand to the young man. Soon Nick left for the capital, and Evelyn stayed in her city to wait for a transfer to another branch. Having seen off her fiancé, she plunged headlong into work. Being preoccupied with other people's problems, the woman forgot about her own. Firmly decided for himself not to dig into the past and leave in relations with his mother and sister, everything as it is. She calmed down and got on with her life, accepting the marriage proposal. Havelin asked Nick to dispense with the lavish celebrations. The bride and groom agreed to get married at a Washington, D.C. registry office after Evelyn's relocation was resolved. By that time, Nick promised to settle the question of rent. Spring was in full swing. Nature was leaving its winter hibernation, and the riot of colors around created a joyful mood. The gulf, birds singing on different voices made hearts flutter. To top it all off, Evelyn was waiting for her transfer to Washington, and she couldn't wait to see her beloved. Nick, as promised, prepared everything for the bride's arrival. He rented an apartment for the first time, adjusted the household, studied the real estate market. And so the long-awaited day came. Evelyn gathered all the things necessary for the first time. She made an agreement with a realtor about selling her apartment and set out for a new life. All along the way, she thought about the last conversation she'd had with her mother and sister. You are a bad daughter, showered her mother with accusations ungrateful. I gave you life. How could I take care of you? Yeah, you went to live with your grandparents. But that was your decision, and I didn't kick you out. It's not my fault you couldn't get along with Mark. I didn't have to be alone for the rest of my life because of you. I was too young when I was widowed, and I needed a man. And you know, not everyone would take in a child, and Mark took you in, and you kicked him out of the house. You always made sure I was lonely because you're selfish. I don't think anyone needs him but you, Evelyn replied. If he whistles, he'll come running. You have no right to insult him. He's my father. Vanessa stood up for him. I've always loved you and respected you as a big sister. You've been my role model. But I didn't think any apartment would come between us. Nor did I expect the price of your love to be an apartment, Evelyn argued. You're ungrateful. Vanessa echoed her mother's accusations. For you material things were more important than family ties. That's not true, Evelyn replied. I never stopped loving you. But you, when you learned that there would be no division of my inheritance, quickly abandoned me. Maria and Vanessa proved Evelyn and her wrong for a long time, trying to press on pity and conscience. But their arguments did not work on Evelyn, giving them a chance to speak. She walked away with the words, I will not allow myself to be manipulated, but I think the grandparents foresaw this situation so they disposed of their property this way and not the other way around. If you can't be happy for me along with me, I won't bother your eyes and will leave. I don't want anything from you, but I don't owe you anything either. Do you have a husband? She turned to her sister, so earn your own apartment. And if you can't, ask your father for help. In a new place, Evelyn settled in quickly. The team was new and young. There was a lot of active work. But Evelyn always got home on time. She gave herself the attitude that family was the most important thing in her life. The appointed date of the first day of summer Nick and Evelyn signed. As agreed, they did not invite guests to their first family party, deciding that it was just for the two of them. It was Maria and Vanessa, and still there was no word. But the realtor found buyers for the apartments to resolve the sale. She took two weeks of unpaid leave and went to her hometown to settle the formalities. Evelyn was about to return, but before leaving she decided to visit her relatives. Approaching her mother's house, she saw her sitting on a bench in the yard. It had only been six months since they had last seen each other, but it seemed to Evelyn that she had aged a lot in that time. Maria sat alone and concentrated, staring at one point in front of her. Sadness and longing were imprinted on her face barely noticeable, 
The wrinkles before had become deep. At the sight of Evelyn's mother, everything squeezed inside. In that moment, she wanted to hug her and feel sorry for her, maybe even apologize for what she'd said in the heat of the moment. On impulse, Evelyn rushed to her mother's side. But at that moment, Mark came out of the driveway. When she saw him, she quickly got up and followed. Evelyn stopped, seeing off her mother and stepmother. She experienced a gamut of feelings, pain from another betrayal, anger, self-pity. Barely holding back tears, she turned and ran back. But at that moment, she heard a familiar voice calling her. Evelyn, it's you. The girl stopped and turning her head, saw her sister with a bag in her hands. And despite her exhausted rhythm, she looked more beautiful. Pregnancy was in her face, flipping from foot to foot. As Vanessa jokingly approached Evelyn, how long ago did this arrive? She asked, as if nothing had happened. Two weeks ago, it's a long time. I'm leaving today and I've come to take care of some business. Vanessa was silent, trying to formulate a question. Yes, I just wanted to stop by and, and say goodbye before I left, Evelyn explained. But no one was home. You must have missed your mom. Vanessa suggested she was getting ready. The girl was silent again, clearly not saying the right thing. To leave. Is everything all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Then I'll go, Evelyn said and turned around. Why don't you come over for a visit? Vanessa asked in an uncertain tone. Not tonight. Some other time, Evelyn promised, and started to go on her way. But her sister called out to her again. Evelyn turned around and saw Vanessa's guilty face. Evelyn. She addressed her sister as before. I'm sorry for what I said to you the other day. You know, hormones. Don't hold it against me. I don't know what came over me, but you're right. I had nothing to do with your inheritance. You're the only heir to your dad and his parents. Yeah, I wasn't so lucky with my dad. He never thought about me. He's lived his whole life and continues to live only for himself. What did my mom see in him? Don't worry, Evelyn reassured her. I'm not mad at you. I understand. Everyone can make mistakes. The main thing is to realize it in time and repent. Evelyn walked over to Vanessa and hugged her, pulling her close to her sister. She felt a push in her stomach and bounced away. Vasileva smiled and put a hand on her tummy and said well there from the tribe and met. The girls both laughed. After the conversation with her sister Evelyn felt as if a mountain had fallen from her shoulders. The only thing that kept her thinking was, had her mother really gotten back together with Mark? Had she forgiven him? Evelyn hesitated to ask Vanessa. She was afraid to break the fragile peace that had formed between them during their last meeting. Why would you even want that information? I don't understand. Nick also asked, if your mom is fine with it, then you shouldn't even care. You know, Nick, whatever she is, she's my mother, and I can't live with that monster around. Evelyn justified herself. What if he hits her again? But you can't stop your mother from talking to him. It's her choice. You're right, I agree. Evelyn, sighing heavily. And then there's your sister. I don't think she'll let you hurt her mother, Nick said before leaving. Then, turning the key in the lock, he kissed his wife on the cheek and disappeared out the door. Evelyn thought about it for a while longer, but gradually everyday tasks distracted her from the bad thoughts. She plunged headlong into her work. On weekends, the newlyweds traveled from morning to evening to look at apartments. They decided not to hurry with the choice, especially since Nick's apartment was not for sale. On the secondary market, nothing suitable for our money. Disappointed, said Evelyn, returning from another viewing. Maybe we should look at new buildings, Nick suggested. They have lower prices. Yes, but we don't know when the house will be finished, and then we'll have to make repairs. You need a lot of money for that too. So it's better to make repairs again than to redo them. With optimism in his voice, said Nick. The next weekend it was decided to look at apartments in houses under construction. After waiting for the end of the work week, the couple were going to the construction company. When Evelyn's phone rang. Hi, sis. She said hello cheerfully, answering the call. 
However, James' voice came out of the receiver. Evelyn, it's not Vanessa, he said. It's James. Something's happened. Evelyn immediately worried. No, don't worry. I said, I'm just calling to let you know you've become an aunt. Our daughter Vanessa was born while she's sleeping, so I thought I'd let you know. Congratulations, shouted Evelyn happily. And maybe, maybe you can come visit us too, James asked. I can't yet at work, she explained. But I'll try to come by New Year's Eve, just as my niece will grow up and get stronger by then. After saying goodbye to her sister's husband, Evelyn told Nick the good news. But she noticed that he reacted a little too calmly, even indifferently. I realize that they're strangers to you, of course, but you could have been happy for me. With resentment in her voice, Evelyn expressed her displeasure. I'm glad, Nick replied. It's just that I think it's time for me to meet your family. It just doesn't seem like the right thing to do. We've been married for three months, and your mother and sister still don't know. Yeah, you're right about that. But you know how complicated my relationship with them is. Evelyn tried to justify herself. But I promised to make it up to them. We'll go there together in the winter. I'll look at some more apartments in new buildings. The newlyweds chose one. The most like the new neighborhood and all the necessary infrastructure. Constructed yards are arranged for recreation for children and adults. Listed Evelyn. Pluses of this object. Even the metro station is planned to open in walking distance and a large selection of apartments with different layouts and on different floors, added Nick. And from the window you can see a small pond. Evelyn perked up. I like everything and the price. The price is reasonable for us. Nick. Yes. But if my apartment was sold, we could buy a two-bedroom in this house. Nick was disappointed. You know, the important thing is to start somewhere. His wife encouraged him. I've got enough money for a one-bedroom. It's better than renting. Well, yes, you're right. The husband agreed, but his tone was still upset. But don't get me wrong. I've never lived off a woman. And now I do not want you to think that I need your apartment. What kind of nonsense is that? Evelyn was indignant. You and I are husband and wife. It's not nonsense. Nick continued. This question is very important to me. What are you trying to tell me? I just think that if you happen to be buying this apartment, you should have it registered in your name. What's more, I'm proposing a prenuptial agreement. Evelyn looked at her husband, trying to understand whether he was serious or joking. But there was not a muscle on Nick's face. He was determined. Well, all right, she agreed, if you insist. Yes, I want my woman to be sure of me at all times. I love you, my knights," Evelyn said with a smile and hugged her husband. Congratulations to you, Evelyn, said the representative of the man in suit and tie, handing the new keys to the same person. You are now the full owner of a one-bedroom apartment with finishes. Thank you, replied Evelyn, and not hiding joy, looked at the people standing on the playground of future neighbors. Keys in a solemn atmosphere handed to all present owners of apartments. Then on the same playground the developer organized a small amateur concert. And in the evening Evelyn and Nick Happy returned home and discussed their move to a new apartment. During the conversation they didn't immediately hear the phone ringing from Nick's jacket pocket, but the caller was persistent. Looking at the screen and seeing an unfamiliar number, Nick was surprised and answered the call. Hello. Yes, yes. This is me selling. I'll be able to drive up next weekend. Yeah. Okay. You got a deal. And dropped the call. Nick grumbled unhappily. About time. Had there really been a buyer for the apartment? Evelyn guessed. I think I'm the only one who's found one. What are we going to do with him now? We could have bought that bigger apartment a month earlier. And now we can't sell the new one. Why don't we just not sell your apartment yet? Evelyn suggested it. Let it stand. No, I don't think so. We'll be looking for a buyer for six months. As long as there's someone willing to buy it, we have to see it through. The boss is the boss, shrugged his shoulders, replied Evelyn. And the next weekend, Nick went to his city and Evelyn, not knowing what to do, walked from corner to corner. 
and then the phone rang. Hi, Sis said hello to Evelyn, answering the call. Hi, Evelyn, said Vanessa, without much joy in her voice. What's up? What are you doing? Yes? I'm thinking about moving to a new apartment. Why are you so sad? Did something happen? I don't know where to start. I got stuck. My sister, mom, and dad. Anyway, they're back together. I don't want him to come home. We're too cramped as it is. Dad got a house in the country from his parents. But mom doesn't want to leave town. Why don't you talk to her? Oh no, I'm not getting involved in your business. I've already given up my share of the apartment. We'll take it from here. Evelyn, what about you? You're definitely not going to claim it. Vanessa asked. No, I'm not. Thanks, sis, you're better than that. With all matters settled in his hometown, Nick returned home satisfied and said to Evelyn, I propose to buy a plot of land in the suburbs and gradually build a summer house. What do you think about it? I think it's a very good idea. Surprisingly, such a plot of land was found very quickly. And on New Year's Eve, the happy newlyweds went to visit Vanessa and Sergi. Hospitable. The hosts gladly painted the gifts brought by her sister and her husband. Evelyn was getting acquainted with her niece, and Vanessa was jokingly indignant. Here was my sister getting married and not even telling anyone. And when the first passion subsided, Evelyn asked, Where's mom? She moved in with her father. Vanessa answered dryly. The older sister did not pursue the subject further. The New Year's Eve party turned out to be fun James Nick. Despite the difference in age, they quickly found a common language. And on the eve of returning home, Evelyn asked her sister, Have you seen your mom for a long time? I haven't seen her since she moved. Vanessa answered and added that if she doesn't call her, it means she's doing well. Evelyn was a little surprised by her sister's answer, but she remained silent. On the day of the guest's departure, Vanessa received a call from her mother. Daughter, can I come to you? Swallowing tears, she asked. What happened? Father, I guess I was wrong to contact him again. Yes, come over, of course. Vanessa invited in a disgruntled tone. But only in your former room. Our bedrooms now. Oh, thank you, Vanessa Tsushko. Rejoiced mother, not paying attention to the warning. I'm already near the house. I'll be right in. A minute later, the doorbell rang. On the threshold stood the mother, and seeing the eldest daughter, she fussed and fixing with her hand the hair that was under the cap, thus covering her eye, said hello. Evelyn noticed a bruise on her mother's face, carefully covered with total cream. Happy holidays. Mom, Evelyn said, hesitating to go up to her and hug her. Meet my husband, Nick. And this is my mom. Maria introduced herself and extended her hand to her son-in-law. I didn't expect you to marry such a handsome man, she said to her daughter. But why do you have a beautiful daughter, smart and handsome? Yes, she got that from me, Maria said coquettishly. Oh, why are we standing at the threshold? Why don't we sit down and celebrate? No, we should get back, said Evelyn. It was nice to see you. Come visit. Vanessa invited us. Would you like to come? Nick replied. After the meeting with Evelyn's mother, she felt bad. All the way she was silent. Understanding his wife's mood, Nick did not bother her. And later from a phone conversation with her sister, Evelyn learned that contacted her father Alina addicted to alcohol. And as soon as they get drunk, they start to find out about each other. Vanessa complained. Scolding turns into fighting. That's why I didn't want my father to move back in. Why didn't you tell me before? Evelyn asked. What difference would it have made? Evelyn, you already helped mom out once. Where's the gratitude? She blames you even more for ruining her family. Evelyn was hurt to hear those words, but she was used to her mother's attitude. I persuaded her to stay, but she decided to go back to her father. Vanessa continued. And when I forbade him to cross the threshold of our house, she signed the apartment over to me in solidarity with him and slammed the door loudly. As you could see, their relationship lasted a little over a month. And now she's living with you. No. A week after you left, her father came for her 
and persuaded her to come back to him without her realizing it. Evelyn said with genuine regret. Why should she be so nervous in her old age? Maybe she needs medical attention. No, I don't think so. I don't think she'd want medical attention. Five years have passed since then. The sisters still called each other, occasionally visiting. Nick and Evelyn gradually built a house, a sauna, and a gazebo on their country estate. Our country house is not for work, but for relaxation, Evelyn said. And indeed on every holiday. And just on weekends they often went out of town, inviting friends to visit. Once, after a telephone conversation with his mother, Nick asked his wife Evelyn, Would you mind if I brought my parents to our country house? They're in poor health. They'll be closer to us here. Evelyn, since the day I met her, I've had a great relationship with my mother-in-law and mother-in-law. That's why she immediately agreed to her husband's proposal. And on the next weekend, the spouses went to Nick's parents and offered them to move into their house. But what about our apartment? Mother hesitated. And what will happen to her? Asked Nick. Let it stand she does not ask for bread. After a little thought, the parents agreed. And soon they were already living at the dacha of their son and daughter-in-law and rejoiced that now they had the opportunity to spend more time in the fresh air. Evelyn was pleased to see the old people happy. She loved secrets with her mother-in-law as she had once done as a child with her grandmother. Nick's mother was an intelligent woman and tried to stay out of their lives. But there was one question she couldn't stop asking. Evelyn, why don't you and Nick have children? She asked one day. I'd like to have grandchildren in my old age. It was a question that had been on her mind for years. She and her husband dreamed of having children. They examined different doctors, took prescribed medications, but everything was useless. Everyone said you're both healthy. Maybe there's an incompatibility between you, and no one could tell you what to do about it. Evelyn had given up hope of becoming a mother, and once in a conversation with her husband, she even suggested that he break up with her and find another woman who could bear him a child. But Nick was outraged when he heard about it. Never you hear, never suggesting that I break up with you. I love you and I wouldn't trade you for any other woman. If God doesn't give us children, then we'll live together and enjoy each other's company. Evelyn and Nick never returned to the subject again. They seemed resigned to their fate. But when Evelyn heard the question of children from the people around them, but when Evelyn heard the question of children from those around her, and she felt uneasy, Vanessa and Serioja had another daughter. They were happily married, but Vanessa had little contact with her mother. Evelyn, having buried Mark, who was stabbed to death by a neighbor in a drunken brawl, was left to live in his house. She asked to go to her youngest daughter's house, but Vanessa didn't want to take her in. I don't think she will be a good example for her granddaughters. The woman explained her decision. I don't want any drunkenness here. Evelyn and her husband came to Maria several times, offering to help, to fix up the house that was almost falling apart. But the mother did not accept any help from her eldest daughter. She abandoned us years ago and went to her Washington, D.C., taking all her money. So go there. She yelled at her. I don't want anything more from you. When I asked you, you didn't want to share. Now get the fuck out of here. Forget you have a mother. You're ungrateful. I raised you alone without a father. And you ruined my family. You kicked my husband out. Vanessa left you. I didn't abandon anyone. Evelyn tried to justify herself. You're the one who threw me out of your life like an unwanted kitten. After grandma and grandpa died, I was floundering on my own. Well, you're just going to keep on floundering. Don't mess with me. I have someone to take care of me. Vanessa has always loved me, unlike you. Yeah, that's why you live here in this shack. Out of spite, Evelyn said. It's none of your business. I can live where I want. Get out of my house, shouted after and running daughters Maria. Having become an unhappy witness of the last scandal, Nick forbade Evelyn to go to her mother and Evelyn herself lost the last desire to visit this woman. Six months after moving to the country house, six months after moving to the country house of his son, 
Nick's father died. The mother was very worried, but tried to hold on. After consultation, the spouses moved her to their apartment. Cramped, but not in offense, said Nick. Don't join us, said the wife. We have a one-room apartment, but it's big. Well, now that I settled in, as mom said, why should our apartment be idle? Let's sell it and exchange it for a two or three room apartment. A year later, the couple celebrated a housewarming party in a spacious three room apartment. That day, the house was full of guests, Vanessa and James, with their daughters came to congratulate relatives. Friends brought a lot of gifts. The holiday was a success. Evelyn and her mother-in-law set a sumptuous table and everyone was satisfied. And in the evening after seeing his friends off, Nick took his relatives to the country house. They wished to stay with them for a few days. Evelyn and her mother-in-law were clearing the table when she felt very bad. Nick's frightened mother called an ambulance and called her son. By the time he returned, a doctor was already sitting near Evelyn. Seeing Nick, she said hello to him and smiled and said, Congratulations, Kali, you're about to become a daddy. And you, mommy, do you need to take care of yourself? She turned to Evelyn. In the next few months, you should not have any excitement or overexertion.